sex. Let's talk about it. The Patreon selected Space Lizard voted in subject that received more votes than any other subject by far is today. Specifically, the female ejaculation and squirting suck was voted in, and we will talk about that. But we will also talk about so much more. So much sex. Who's having sex? What kind of sex are people having? Are you having more or less sex than the average meat sack? Are you having freakier sex? Or is it pretty vanilla? Uh, Heads up on this one, sex parents. I think you understand this already, but uh, talking graphically about sex today. If you're cool with, you know, giving your kids some some sex ed right now, uh, good for you. If if you don't want to have to answer a lot, I mean a lot, of new questions, you may want to have them sit this one out. Going to talk about kink today. What kinds of kink are out there? Are you kinky? Why do we like kink? Why do uh, so many people get turned on by getting tied up or spanked or blindfolded or playing dress up? It feels like the right time with so much of the world stuck inside to talk about sex. Porn, sex robots, female ejaculation. Going to talk about all that today. Going to throw a lot of numbers out, a lot of interesting information and fun coming your way. Lucifina is interested in what we have to say today. Very interested. It's the sexiest suck yet today on Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. I'm Dan Cummins, a.k.a. the Suck Master, the shelter-in-place court jester, Mama Ridgeway's cleanest ween, and you, dearest Meat Sack. You're listening to Time Suck. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. Hail Nimrod. Praise Bojangles. Glory be to Triple M and Lucifina. Lucifina, how about you put on that latex bodysuit and get out the handcuffs and the whip? This Dom wants a sub. Shit's getting interesting today, my lady. Uh, real quick apology. Uh, last week, Amy Jean, who helped clear up a lot of information for the pandem- pandemic suck last week. Not a nurse. She's a PA, a physician's assistant. Totally different medical job. I am ignorant to all the titles, so damn it, Lucifina, why did you make me say nurse? So sorry, Amy, and thank you again for your help. And thank you all for your continued ratings and reviews. Thanks to all the new listeners who have hopped on board during the change in schedule many have undergone of late. Thanks for checking out my new stand-up special, Get Out of Here, Devil. Won't be available for a few weeks yet on video. I won't be able to buy the audio for a few weeks, but you can listen to the whole thing for free on Pandora right now. And thank you, Pandora, man. Drew Miller, Pandora, always been so good to me. Uh, Much appreciated. Link in the episode description to that. Uh, Link also to this album on my Instagram uh, profile, at Dan Cummins Comedy. Also, check out the awesome and really inspiring podcast documentary, a mediocre documentary with Tom and Dan on Amazon Prime. It just went on Prime. It's so good. It's free to stream if you're a Prime member. Uh, Their story that they lay out in the doc is the story that inspired me to launch into the podcast world. Tom and Dan from a mediocre time, Florida's best podcast, one of the best podcasts in the game. And they still inspire me. They're the pod fathers to me, at least they're, they're my pod fathers. Also uh, speaking of great podcasts, I will be on Andrew Santino's whiskey ginger podcast. Andrew and I have had mutual friends for a long time, met each other years ago. I thought he was uh, very funny for a long time. Uh, great actor currently starring uh, with the incredibly successful Underground rapper Lil Dicky on FXX, FXX's Dave. Uh, looks like a good show. And I'm going to Skype in, drink some whiskey. Bullet rye and ginger ale, one of my favorite drinks, actually. So I'll be on uh, Whiskey Ginger, if all goes uh, according to plan on the 10th of April. Uh, been weird in the badmagicmerch.com store for a while now, and I love weird. But back to some classics this week. I get that not everybody wants to wear a t-shirt with my head and a lady's body where you can see uh, her pubic hair which is a shirt uh, we've actually done. <laughs> Gosh dang, oh my heck. Uh, so this week, a blue with gold letters shirt just saying time suck, nice and simple. Made out of 200% imported pangolin scales because I got them at a, at a great price. Uh, they were on sale for some reason. Also, a new classic black tee with my face from the logo. If you like a graphic tee, also like to keep it simple. Also made out of 200% imported pangolin scales because again, uh, for whatever reason, that shit is cheap right now. Uh, thanks to all the time suckers who joined Patreon, started listening to the weekly Secret Suck, became space lizards. Because of you, we are able to give $5,000 this month to a COVID-19 inspired charity, Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels has uh, set up a special COVID-19 response fund. Here's their official statement regarding that. Vulnerable seniors are at the greatest risk amid COVID-19. Local Meals on Wheels 
Programs are on the front lines every day, focused on doing all they can to keep older Americans safe and nourished in communities across the country. The costs and efforts needed to protect seniors from COVID-19 require additional emergency funds, and that is why we are asking federal lawmakers, corporations, foundations, and the general public to remember these vulnerable seniors in our national response. Uh, what is Meals on Wheels? Uh, wheels, on, wheels on Meals. <laughs> wheels on Meals. It's Wheels. It's fucking Wheels on Meals is a different thing than I just started. Uh, meals on Wheels delivers meals to individuals at home who are unable to purchase or prepare their own meals. They deliver to those 60 or older who are disabled, homebound, uh, who have no one available to aid with meal preparation and are unable to leave home without the assistance of another person. So we all know some seniors or we, we are a senior, you know, I know some of you and seniors, some of the, uh, you know, people most at risk of being harmed, you know, by COVID-19 people who, who need to really make sure to avoid contact with others who need to stay inside, but they still got to eat. They still need food. They still need a little bit of socialization. And that's what meals on wheels is for. And the, uh, the link will be in the episode description for that. If you want to check it out further. So hail Nimrod, we're helping put food in people's bellies. And now, you know, let's, uh, let's get to fucking. So much to talk about today. I learned so much and uh, not even joking. This is definitely going to uh, improve my sex life. Lindsay and I are already having some uh, good conversations about all this. Going to go over a lot of sexual statistics up top. Uh, how do our sex lives in America, you know, compare to the sex lives of Americans in the 1940s, 1950s? That was when America's sex lives really first began to be studied. How do the sex lives of Americans stack up to the sex lives of uh, other people across the world? Going to talk about kink, as I said, uh, what type of fetishes do people have? What's out there? Going to talk about porn. Is it bad for us? Can it be good for us? What do the studies say? What do I think? Going to talk about sex robots. You know I love a sex robot. What is the future going to bring to our sex lives? And will it be the best thing ever? Or will it be the end of our species? Not joking. Or both. Uh, Going to talk way too much about pony play. God dang. I, uh, I fell into a pony play fucking hole this week. And, uh, and I want to drag you in with me. I don't want to be alone down there. Uh, finally, going to talk about my own sex life uh, uh, by interviewing my wife, Lindsay, and just also get a female perspective on, uh, on sex. And, and I know that this is now two weeks in a row where I've done an interview. Is that the new normal? No. For you traditionalist suckers, don't worry. Not changing the show format. Uh, it'll probably be a long time before I have another guest on. Uh, it's just the way the topics worked out. It felt weird to do an episode about disease, about the pandemic, and not talk to a disease expert when that opportunity arose. And it felt weird not to bring in a female perspective on sex uh, when I can do that. And, uh, and yes, space lizards, I will also talk about female ejaculate and squirting. <laughs> so let us, uh, let us begin. Uh, I like the numbers. Here we go. Uh, big thanks to the Kinsey Institute.org for compiling so many sexual statistics in one place. The Kinsey Institute at Indiana University was founded by Alfred Kinsey, an American biologist, professor of entomology, zoology, and sexologist, who in 1947 founded the Institute for Sex Research at Indiana University. His studies most famously published as his Kinsey Reports, controversial at the time, very controversial, heavily influenced social and cultural sexual values in the U.S. as well as internationally, sexual behavior in the human male, was published in 1948, followed by Sexual Behavior in the Human Female in 1953. And it was the first time, uh, you know, really in the world that sex had been studied so scientifically. Uh, Kinsey, widely regarded as the first major figure in American sexology, the study of human sexual life and relationships, blew people's minds in the 40s and 50s with the sexual findings he discovered. In an age when premarital sex was much more taboo than it is now, he reported, for example, that between 67 and 98% of men had had premarital sex dependent on socioeconomic status and around 50% of women had engaged in premarital sex. So hail Lucifina, people heading out to those sock hop parking lots, poodle skirts getting pushed up over knit cardigans in the back seats of Chevy Bel Airs across the land. For those of you born in the 70s and 80s, that means your grandparents weren't waiting for the wedding bells to get hot and heavy, hard and wet. Dr. Kinsey recognized that a lot of these sexual acts that were frowned upon in polite society and, you know, uh, really weren't talked about publicly were regularly taking place behind closed doors. For example, he reported that 48.9% of married couples engaged in oral sex and 11% of married males had had anal sex. So think about that. 
your sweet papa heading round to park his salami truck in Nana's back alley. Maybe heading round to his uh, fishing buddy Dale's rear dock. See if he could slide a sausage boat in back there. You know, one in 10 chance. Uh, Dr. Kinsey also found that around half of married men had had extramarital affairs. And 69% of white men, uh, I guess those were the dudes he studied the most back in, you know, it was the segregated time he lived in. 69% of those white men uh, paid to have sex with prostitutes. 69%. That number is way higher than I expected it to be. And I am aware that, uh, you know, many of you probably said, 69. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I had to fight it myself. Uh, back in the conservative, wholesome, leave it to beaver and father knows best 1950s when TV married couples were sleeping in separate beds. He reported that 62% of women said they masturbated. Ah, gee, Wally. Why is mom making those weird noises in the shower? She must have the water turned up too hot. All that moaning sounds like it's really hurting her. Americans were a lot freakier in real life than they were on TV in the 40s and 50s. What about today? Today, almost everyone on TV seems to be fucking, right? Late night hosts make casual anal sex references, hardcore porn, double penetration, ATM, all a few clicks away on everyone's phones. I Googled Pornhub sex categories, clicked the sex categories menu link, and then the, the top most relevant video was titled, he fucks my tight ass until I squirt 4K. Now, did I watch this video? No. I was researching a ton of shit, you know, and I didn't have time for that. So I, uh, I skimmed it. I skimmed it. I made the good parts. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that it followed through on what was promised in the title. I like honesty and advertising. I like to be thorough. So if you are curious about that particular flick, it did, from my observation, appear that she had a tight ass. And he definitely fucked it. There's no question there. Uh, and she for sure squirted. And it did appear to be shot in 4K. She had a mole on her upper thigh that I think she might want to get checked out, you know. Uh, looking at categories, most are types of people, body types or ethnicity, not types of sexual activity. Big tits, Asian, Russian, redhead, German, French, ebony, Latina, Indian, Brazilian, Arab, small tits, etc. cetera. Uh, there are a variety of sexual fetishes or types of sexual activity listed as well, though. Role play, strap on, feet, fisting, pussy licking, blowjob, pissing, toys, fetish, handjob, anal, double penetration, orgy, bondage, sex in public, you know, et cetera. Everyone with the web browsing device with web or cellular access is a few clicks away from videos in these categories. Videos with titles like, and these titles are all pulled straight from page one of the Pornhub category. This week's most viewed porn videos in the United States. These are the most viewed. I did not make up these titles. I bet your dick has grown since then. Older sis, older stepsis, Jules Blue Cream Pie. Okay. Fucking my friend's sister on spring break. All right. Big ass stepmom can't go out with coronavirus lockdown, so she fucks. Really, I'm really picking up on a theme here. Thick ebony yoga girl Ariana Aiden takes white cock. Oh, thank God. She doesn't appear based on the thumbnail and title to be related to anyone she's having sex with. A uh, young, big-breasted mom makes love to stepson. Okay. All right. Back to the, the family theme. Cheerleader coerced into sex with coach and her husband. Not loving the coers part of that title. Seems a little rapey, but I guess it's just a fantasy. Uh, one more. Fucking my thick Latina mom because quarantine for coronavirus. Oh my heck, gosh dang, that's a lot of incest. A lot of taboo breaking going on in the popular video section. Jesus Christ. A lot of family stuff. Don't want to don't kink shame, as people like to say now. But um, I find the incest angle a bit disturbing. Like, uh, is that how it has been for a while? I think so. Or, or, or is it is it more now? Like, are just a lot of horny people locked up with their families and mom and stepmom are starting to look a little different? What the flip? But again, this is all fantasy. Based on any sex study ever recently uh, conducted anecdotal evidence, the most common sexual activity in the U.S. and hopefully not anywhere else uh, does not appear to be stepsister or mom or stepmom fucking. However, experts theorize that cases of actual incest could, you know, uh, uh, and likely are, be vastly underreported due to the shame and stigma associated with acts of incest. So hopefully incest is not a common sexual activity uh, anywhere. God, uh, dear God, I hope not. But, uh, but is the fantasy maybe not so harmless? Do, do porn fantasies lead to committing those same acts in real life? We're going to get into that debate later. The results surprised me. Uh, we'll get into the debate regarding pornographic fantasy. Does it serve merely as a harmless release for people's fantasies or does it increase the viewer's sexual desire, push them towards wanting to turn fantasy into reality? Uh, right now, we're going to get back to data. 
In this age of easily accessed hardcore sexuality, what kind of sex are people having when they're not being filmed, when they're not being paid for it? Let's go over some recent numbers. The following information is based on data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, the CDC's National Survey of Family Growth. Uh, data gathered from 2015 to 2017. I had a hell of a time finding the size of the study for this particular set of years, but uh, NSFG studies began back in 1973. And the total sample size based on, you know, previous studies done by the same organization likely to be between uh, 10,000 and 13,000 people. So, uh, you know, a good size sample. First, let's compare premarital sex in the 40s and 50s uh, versus now with this study's numbers. Kinsey said that 67 to 98% of men had premarital sex, depending on socioeconomic status, and that around 50% of women had engaged in premarital sex. Now, 95% of men and women report having sex before marriage. A high number, but I believe it. Uh, so if you waited, you are in rare company. Also, if you and your partner are waiting for uh, you know, marriage um, you know, you know, before having sex and, and this partner told you that they'd never had sex with anyone else either before you guys get married, uh, there's a decent chance they may be bullshitting you. Another study conducted in, conducted in 2018 found after interviewing over 2000 sexually active adults that 29% had lied to a sexual partner about how many past sexual partners they'd had. And that number 29% honestly seems a little low to me. Uh, damn it, Lucifina, you said you only had eyes for me. Uh, Dr. Kinsey, Found that in the 40s and 50s, 48.9% of married couples engaged in oral sex, right? 11% of married males had had anal sex. How does that compare to now? 89% of sexually active women surveyed in the recent NSFG study, married or unmarried, had engaged in oral sex with an opposite sex partner. So, woo-wee! Break out the blowjobs! Big gains! Big gains and blowjobs over the past several decades. Thank you, porn. Thank you for normalizing that. 90% uh, of sexually active men had gone down on their partner. So Taco Tuesday, going down is going up. You get it. 36% uh, of women surveyed admitted to having had anal sex. Uh, curiously, I'm not sure Kinsey found out how many women in the 1940s or 50s admitted to anal sex. I could not find that particular data. I found another study that said in 92, 16% of women, you know, said they tried anal sex. So, you know, number more than doubled. Anal sex does appear to be on the rise. Now, is that because of all the anal porn out there on the web? Or is there so much anal porn because that's what people were already engaging in and that's what they wanted to see? A little, little classic chicken or the egg? Classic dick or the butt? Did the butt come first or did the dick come first? Pun not intended. 44% of men in this recent NSFG study said that they'd had anal sex with a woman at some point in their lifetime. Uh, Dr. Kinsey's you know, study found that roughly half of men cheated on their wives in the 40s and 50s. And that 69% of white men, again, kind of weird, you know, but it was just that dudes, uh, had paid for prostitution. How does that compare to now? Well, a 2016 YouGov survey of 1,000 men and women found that only 12% of men, only 1% of women admitted to having ever paid for sex. Uh, very little variance in this study between races, by the way. A few other studies seem to back up the trend. The prostitution may actually be way, way down. In the age of hardcore porn, uh, you know, much less prostitution possibly than there was in the supposedly wholesome Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, 1950s. So does more porn equal less prostitution? Possibly. Some sociologists in favor of porn argue that readily available porn, in addition to more modern sex toys and sex dolls, provide a sexual outlet that does indeed replace prostitution. And yes, we will be talking about sex dolls later. Uh, fucking sex robot dolls. Westworld. Westworld. Please don't kill us robots. Um, so what about cheating? You know, I've heard the argument many times that all this porn increases infidelity. More porn equals more strain, more affairs, more cheating, right? Numbers do not back this up. Not even close, actually. I was very surprised. According to the 2017 General Social Survey conducted by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, one of the largest independent social research organizations in the U.S., only 20% of men report now to ever having had an extramarital affair. Now, could more people be lying than they were back in the 40s and 50s and skewing the numbers? Yeah, of course. It's possible, but it's highly unlikely. If anything, the social pressure to lie about things like cheating, anal sex, paying for prostitutes, uh, et cetera, was much greater back in the much more sexually conservative 40s and 50s. 
So why do less people seem to be cheating, at least uh, here in America, in the age of hardcore porn? Porn advocates would say that porn leads to less cheating because, again, it provides a sexually satisfying alternative to cheating, just like it provides a, a sexually satisfying alternative to prostitution. It's an interesting theory. Uh, before diving into how porn, uh, you know, porn's effects on sexuality, relationships, and society, uh, before diving further there, let's go over some other numbers from that recent NSFG study so you can see how uh, you stack up to current sexual American norms. By age 15, 13% of females, 18% of males claim to have lost their virginity via vaginal intercourse. By age 19, those figures stand at 68 and 69%. So they, they even out as, uh, as the teens get older. 40 to, 40, uh, 40 to 44 year olds were asked how many sex partners they'd had in their lifetime. The median number of opposite sex partners is 3.4 for women, 6.4 for men. So half the respondents had more partners than that, you know, half had less. 0.4% of 40 to 44-year-old men surveyed and 1.3% of that same age in women reported having zero sexual partners. And that's okay. Being a noodle McDryween doesn't mean you're going to go full McVeigh and become some incel determined to attack the public or the government because no one wants to fuck you. Some people as hard as it is for others to believe, uh, just don't have an interest in sex. I've had a few friends that way where I'm like, I don't think, you know, people are like, oh man, are they gay? Are they straight? What's going on? I was like, I, I just don't think they're, they have any interest. I think they're just asexual. It is possible to be asexual and it's actually not considered psychologically unhealthy. Going back to Dr. Kinsey, the sexologist, he rated individuals from zero to six according to their sexual orientation from heterosexual to homosexual, the Kinsey scale. Zero is strictly heterosexual. Six is strictly homosexual. Numbers 1.5 indicate bisexuality to some degree, but he also labeled 1.5% of the adult male population as X, not on the scale. X indicating asexual. Uh, sticking with recently surveyed 40 to 44-year-olds, 22% of women reported only having uh, ever had one opposite sex partner. 10% of men reported only one opposite sex partner. 40% of men reported three to six opposite partners. 30% reported the, the same amount with, uh, with women there. 8% uh, of women reported 15 or more opposite sex partners and 30% of men reported that number. Big variance there between genders. Some of the women in that 8% must be working overtime to kick up the numbers for 30% uh, to the dudes. You know? Or around 22% of those dudes are full of shit. How, how many women have you slept with noodle? Ha, <laughs> shit, thousand. Maybe 2,000. That, fuck. And that's this year, motherfucker. That's this year. Uh, those in the 25 to 44 uh, age group report the following numbers for other types of sexual experience. 12% of women report having had at least uh, some same-sex sexual experience. 6% of dudes report having had at least some same-sex sexual experience. So now we have a, a feel you know, for current norms regarding what kinds of sex people are having. We'll get more into kink later. Uh, you know, but what about frequency? How often are people having sex? 2.3 times a day is the average. So if you're only having sex, say, a couple times a month, you might as well retire that rusty old dick or mangy old puss, you know what I mean? Put it in a box, write no longer in service, and throw it in the fucking basement, loser. Uh, JK! Ha <laughs> JK meets sex. I joke for funsies. No, according to the uh, general social survey, the average American adult has sex about 60 times a year. A little more than once a week. Uh, and if you're not having near that much sex, do not despair. The same survey asked questions about overall happiness. And interestingly, it found that people who didn't have any sex at all in the past year were just as happy as those who did have sex in the past year. Uh, also, frequency of sex changes over the course of a person's lifetime, as you would expect. In the 44 to 59 age group, 88% of men, 72% of women, still getting wet and hard, still swinging that meat hammer, still... Still filling those flesh holes. Uh, dudes in that group, you know, they're hitting money shots about seven times a month. Women getting around uh, six and a half semen deposits a month. In the 57 to 72 age group, 72% of men are still slanging that dick. Still swinging those man nuts. Still got a, lot of, still got a little bob and weave left in that one-eyed prize fighter. 45% uh, of women age 57 to 72 still getting their oil changed. Still testing the shocks on the old chesticles. Uh, dudes in this age group uh, putting some lady lotion on their veiny fly rod about 4.3 times a month. Women getting that gray hedge trimmed about 3.8 times a month. 
And yes, I know I have an eighth grade sense of humor about this shit and I love it. Uh, the National Survey of Sexual Health and Behavior asked people what sex acts they had done in the past month, past year, ever in their lifetime. Right? So what's going on there? Let's start with the youth. What's going on in the 25 to 29 year old camp? Uh, these numbers are based on sexual activity that occurred um, in, the, in the previous year only. I'll just stick to the, the year. There's too, too many numbers to go over all of them. Let's start with masturbation. Playing a little five on one, paddling the pink canoe, burping the worm, flicking the bean, auditioning those finger puppets, spreading that bearded, spearing that bearded clam. You get it. 69% of men are jerking it. That seems low to me. Any number lower than 100% seems low to me for 20 somethings beating their mate, beating it like they fucking, like it fucking killed their parents. Only 69% of young dudes out there flattening their curves. Hmm. 52% of 20 something women reported putting on a one woman EDM festival, two finger DJ competition. Maybe sometimes a two-handed competition. Maybe sometimes one hand's using a few fingers. The other hand's holding some uh, kind of vibrating electronic device. Maybe one hand's hitting the clit like it just said something highly offensive and then it just kept saying it over and over at a regular pace for about 10, 15 minutes. 74% of both men and women aged 25 to 29 reported regularly engaging in vaginal intercourse. 46% of men, 5% of women in this age group reported receiving oral sex from a woman. 40% of men, 1.1% of women reported giving oral to a woman. Odd variation when it comes to the puss licking stats. Seems like a lot more women are getting their pussy licked by other women than they are licking some other woman's puss. What's going on there? Seems seems to be a giver shortage. Seems to be a receiver surplus. Sounds like a couple of poor women's tongues are about to fall out of their heads. A couple women about to file workman's comp claims. Going to head to the doctor with jaw pain and bad backs. 1.2% of men. 36% of women in this age group report receiving oral sex from a dude. 2.7% of men, 50% of women report giving blowjobs. Finally, 0.9% of men, 5.3% of women report receiving anal sex, while 10% of men report inserting their penis into another's anus, male or female. That number seems low to me. 44% of men in the same study reported inserting their penis into an anus at some point, but only 10% in the 20-year-old camp there had done it in the past year. And I guess that actually does make sense. Because if you don't do it right, you're not getting invited back. Towards the end of this suck, I'll share some sex tips, uh, you know, uh, that I've found about how to live your best life in bed, including how to have anal sex. Two quick hints now, use lots of lube and fucking slow down. Anal sex is not the time to try and see how fast your hot rod goes from zero to 60. Not the place to peel out and burn some rubber. Okay, now let's talk about kink. This might be my favorite part. Hey, Lucifina. I feel the sexual side of our sultry goddess strongly right now. Lucifina loves kink. We went, we went over the basics of sexual activity, but how many people are getting whipped? How many people are getting freaky? Debbie Herbenick, an applied health science professor and sex researcher at Indiana University's Kinsey Institute, conducted the Sexual Exploration in America study in 2015 with several colleagues. For the first time, Herbenick says, this study established a baseline for This is the percentage of Americans who have engaged in spanking or public sex or threesomes or what have you. More than 2,000 adults, 18 and older, mostly heterosexual, participated in an online survey that inquired about their relationship status, sexual orientation, how recently they'd engaged in and how appealing they found a variety of sexual behaviors. So let's let's take a pervy little peek on what was discovered. Are you a toe licker? You like those toes? You like those little piggies? Like to put them in your mouth? Uh, If you are statistically, odds are you're a dude. 25.6% of those surveyed said they had licked a partner's toes. Only 10.9% of women reported doing a little toe licking. And I I get it if they're looking at dudes' toes. Women seem to be hitting the pedicures uh, a lot more often than dudes. Like, I think Lindsay has very sexy feet. She does a great job taking care of them. Pedicures, lotion, foot massages. She doesn't fuck around with her feet. My feet are horrific. My feet look like I was cursed by a fucking witch and I was turned into part swamp troll or part hobbit. My toes are hairy and mangled. My, my feet look like I got stuck in a World War I trench for several months, got some foot rot, some trench rot. When I wear flip-flops and I hear a baby cry, I assume it's probably because the baby just saw one of my fucking monster feet. Who would want to suck those toes? I don't know, but not me. Uh, you like getting tied up? If you find that thought very appealing, even odds as to whether you are a man or a woman, 8% of men, 9% of women report like being, they like being tied up. Do you like it rough? This is more common than I thought. 14% of men, 12% of women say that they like rough sex very, very much. What about lingerie? 
How many sexually active women have ever worn some form of lingerie at some point in their life? 75.4%. Nice. Fishnets, heeled boots, corsets, crotches, panties all day. Uh, what about sex in public? 45.4% of dudes, 42.9% uh, of women surveyed reported having sex in public at some point in their lives. However, only 6% of dudes and 4.7% of women reported having sex in public in the past year. And that variance actually does make sense to me. Because I, like, I wonder how much uh, of public, uh, the public sex being had was done um, in the sense of engaging in some kind of kinky voyeurism or exhibitionism, I guess exhibitionism is the appropriate term there, versus how much of it was done when people were younger, when they were like teens, because having sex at home just wasn't an option because they would get caught by a, a disapproving family member. Also, I'm apparently kinkier than I realized. So far, I've done all of this uh, at some point, oral, anal, premarital, the higher end with partners, feet, bondage, lingerie, public, you know, sex, sex with various types of animals, you know, you know, the stuff we've talked about, getting defecated on, defecating on others, uh, having someone hit me in the balls with a rubber mallet while someone else shocks my dick with a cattle prod. And then a third person sticks a Roman candle in my ass and lights it while three other people sit behind a scores table and hold up scores uh, of one to 10 based on how well they think I reacted. Showbiz! That is how they do it in Hollywood. Uh, kidding about everything from animals on. Not kidding about anything I uh, said before. it. I feel like Albert Fish, if he were alive today, would find all of this terribly boring. It's like, well, when someone eating a peanut butter butter, when someone getting crazy. Uh, I was worried that I would be so boring. I, I, feel, I feel like so far I don't feel too boring. I feel like Lucifine is pleased with me. 25.8% uh, of guys have role played at some point in their life. 21.8% of women have role played. And I, I could, I could work on this a lot. I am fucking terrible at role play, like, like really bad. I have a hard time staying in character, and I, and I want to laugh all the time, all because all of my instinctive character choices veer towards absurdist comedy, which is not sexy, which is not great for the bedroom. You know, hard to pull off being like some smooth character, like, so, uh, so can I buy you a drink? You know, I think I know what you like since uh, I spent the past few years spending two to three nights a week hiding in the bushes in your backyard. What? What? How did I ruin it? Come on. I thought I'd play the mentally unstable creepy stalker who finally found you in the bar. That's, that wasn't what you wanted? Uh, what about whipping? Who wants to be playfully whipped by their partner or to playfully whip their partner during sex? 16.2% of men, 13.8% of women report experiencing this at some point in their lifetime. And what about getting spanked? 29.5% of men report receiving at least one sexual spanking in their lifetime. 34.1% of women reported receiving at least one sexual spanking in their lifetime. 10% of women had received a sexual spanking in the past month, just in the past month. So what's with all the, what's with all the spankings? Some of us meat sacks have gotten hard and or wet over a good old fashioned smack to the ass for a long, long time. I'm gonna do a little deeper dive on spankings right now. Uh, 1960, an Italian archeologist named Carlo Mario Lorecci, descended into some tombs in the towns of Tarquinia, a necropolis in the refined Etruscan civilization that inhabited ancient Italy from about 3500 BCE until its assimilation into the Roman Empire or, you know, Roman Republic, I guess, in the fourth century BCE. Aside from bodies, he found countless frescoes depicting male boxers, uh, sexualized female dancers, and uh, in what's known as the Tomb of the Floggings, he found all kinds of erotic frescoes. One uh, image he found is an image of a nude woman bent over holding the hips of a smiling bearded man while a young man happily whips her ass from behind. Oldest known example of an erotic spanking. It dates to roughly 490 BCE, over 2,500 years ago. Late 19th and early 20th century, Austrian psychoanalyst, future suck subject Sigmund Freud he thought that sexual spankings were related to childhood spankings, believing that the punishment early on could lead to sadomasochistic sexual preferences in adulthood. And I want to say, fuck you, Freud, because I, I feel like Freud single-handedly messed my head up about spankings until this episode, to some degree. Freud was somewhat obsessed with linking childhood parental relationships to adult sexuality, most notably in his infamous Oedipus Complex, which I you know, remember studying a bunch back when I was a psych student. The positive Oedipus complex refers to a child's unconscious sexual desire for the opposite sex parent and hatred for the same sex parent. And then there's the negative, as he called it, Oedipus complex, referring to a child's unconscious desire for the same sex parent, hatred for the opposite sex parent. He thought that all kids were sexually obsessed with their parents. Freud considered a child's later identification with their same sex parent to be the uh, successful outcome of this complex 
and he thought an unsuccessful outcome uh, could lead to neurosis, pedophilia, and homosexuality. And, and no one really believes in most aspects of this complex today. It was just a theory of Freud's. He lived a long time ago, and he made some valuable contributions to the understanding of human consciousness and the subconsciousness. He also said a bunch of crazy shit. Uh, if adult sexuality is not tied to childhood parental relationships as much as Freud thought, why do so many of us get turned on by a smack to the bottom? Science seems to offer some answers. Uh, biologically, when a person enjoys a sexual act, their brain releases dopamine, the neurotransmitter that heats up the brain's reward and pleasure centers. So if someone enjoys being spanked or doing the spanking, the dopamine release signals to the brain to keep going, continue, keep spanking, hurts so good. But why does anyone's dopamine get released from a spanking specifically? Something that some people view as solely as a, as a painful act. Well, Dr. Rebecca Plant, an associate professor in, at uh, Ithaca's College's, Ithaca College's Department of Sociology, she tried to answer this question in her study, Sexual Spanking, the Self and the Construction of Deviance in 2006. One thing she points out right away is that there isn't just one reason that people like to be spanked. And this kind of goes for all kink and all the sex. You know, it's, it's, it's a vast variety of, of reasons why we do these things. Um, so she said, yeah, there's not just one reason. There's different reasons for enjoying. It's like there's different, uh, you know, ways of being spanked. You know, she talks about there's the, the basic hand to ass motion during sex. Uh, a couple lighter taps, you know, when having, quote, doggy style sex. There's the, uh, the bent over the chair, cane or paddle to the ass type of spanking. Uh, there's, of course, the uh, having somebody tie you up to a tree, facing the tree, and then they get 12 friends uh, to uh, all dress up like clowns, and then all 12 clowns get wiffle ball bats, and they pile into a Geo Metro, and they drive around the tree to confuse you, and then they all pile out unexpectedly, and they all fucking hit you in the ass with the bats as, as hard as they can, and then they pile back in, the, in and, then, and then you come as soon as they start to drive off, you're like, ah, they clown me. Ah, you guys, you guys clown me. You know, there's that kind of spanking that we all know about. Um, back to being serious now. Some of the pleasure in being spanked might have a lot to do with the unique physical anatomy of the, buttock, the, of the buttocks. You know, part of it's just that simple. Dr. Plant says, you're talking about this fairly well-protected muscular region of the body that's right at the base of the spine where there are quite a bit of nerves. So it's sensitive. So it's, that, it's sensitive, but it's cushioned. So part of it is that. You know, it's just, it's just a, a good place to, to hit and not hurt somebody in a, you know, uh, like, like, like with a bone or something. Uh, Dr. Dulcina, Pitagora, a licensed psychotherapist, sex therapist, and former New York City dominatrix who refers to herself as the kink doctor, offers other possibilities. When asked, why do you think spanking is such a popular sexual activity, she says, because it's something everybody knows about. It's easy for us to talk about. In our culture, a lot of us grew up with the threat or actuality of spanking as kids for punishment. There's an inherent power dynamic in that when you're a kid. Okay, so maybe Freud was on to something sometimes. Uh, spanking can be part of a BDSM sexual relationship, uh, BDSM being bondage, discipline, domination, submission, sadism, masochism. Uh, the person being spanked would be the sub or the submissive. The person doing the spanking would be the dom or the dominant. And in an interview about why she liked it, one sub said, I'm really a type A independent person in my daily life. I'm future driven. I'm organized. I'm confident. I'm loud and outgoing. In order to, in, in, yeah, excuse me, in order to give up and control or in order to give up control and relax, I have to make an effort. Being submissive allows me to give up control. Uh, that makes sense psychologically to me. It still doesn't fully answer the question though, like, like why specifically be spanked in that situation? And, and essentially there is no one answer. For some, it just feels good. For others, they might just want to try something new. It's something, you know, that they heard of. Uh, for some, it's, you know, part of that whole submission, letting go not being in control, that is sexually satisfying. Uh, it can also be a part of rough sex. Uh, why do people engage in what's called rough sex? Uh, sometimes the answer there can be as simple as just to alleviate boredom. Humans, men and women alike, have a tendency to grow tired of sexual routines. We need to keep mixing things up in order to maintain sexual excitement, a phenomenon sex, researcher, sex researchers refer to as the Coolidge effect. I love learning about the Coolidge effect this week. When our interest in sex starts to wane, exposure to a new kind of sex or new partner has a proven way of bringing it back. This phenomenon, formerly dubbed the Coolidge Effect, got its name from a popular anecdote about a visit that U.S. President Calvin Coolidge and his wife supposedly made to a chicken farm. And the story goes something like this. A little old-timey language here. 
Uh, Mrs. Coolidge, observing the vigor with which one particularly prominent rooster covered hen after hen, asked the guide to make certain that the president took note of the rooster's behavior. When President Coolidge got to the hen yard, the rooster was pointed out and his exploits recounted by the guide, who added that Mrs. Coolidge had requested that the president be made aware of the rooster's prowess. The president reflected for a moment and replied, tell Mrs. Coolidge that there is more than one hen. Oh, Calvin, you rascal, you. So do you see what he's saying there? He's like, why, why was the rooster so sexually amped up? Not well, because there was more than one hen. You know, he's, he's getting after some variety. The Coolidge effect has been documented in several animal species. For instance, research has found that when a male rat is placed inside a cage with several female rats that are in heat, he will mate with all of them until he appears exhausted. However, if a new female is then introduced to the cage, males often experience an immediately renewed interest in sex and they begin mating with her. And I got to say, I, I do get it. New is fun. I used to feel guilty for thinking that, but it is science. We're wired to think that. We're wired to want new. The Coolidge effect has been documented in humans. For instance, in one study, male participants were either exposed to constant or varied sexual stimuli, while their level of sexual arousal was measured by a device that recorded changes in their penile circumference. So are they, how hard are they getting? The men who were repeatedly shown the same stimuli showed less arousal over time. Right, they just kind of got over it. The dudes who were exposed to varied stimuli maintained higher levels consistently of arousal. Just variety alone kept them more sexually excited. Another study found that after watching porn clips featuring the same actress over a period of several days, exposure to porn featuring a new actress was linked not only to faster ejaculation, but also to the release of more active sperm. Faster, bigger money shot, just because it was a, a new person they were looking at. This suggests that the Coolidge effect may have an evolutionary explanation behind it uh, and that it might potentially increase men's odds of reproductive success with a new partner. Men are hardwired to want to spread our DNA to new partners. Doesn't mean we should cheat in relationships, you know, where it is an agreed upon no-no. You know, you can't be like, baby, baby, don't be mad. I, I didn't want to fuck the neighbor lady. I needed to. I had to. Uh, that's probably not going to be too well received. Uh, the Coolidge effect also has been documented in females although the pattern tends to be somewhat less pronounced. For instance, research on female hamsters found that after mating with one male hamster until exhaustion, they would demonstrate a renewed interest in sex if a new male was introduced to the cage, just like the rats, you know? Also, research on women has found that just like men, they show some degree of habituation in response to repeated presentations of the same erotic stimulus, right? If they're showing the same images over and over again, they also get bored, which is what this tells us is the Coolidge effect is not uniquely a male phenomenon not by any stretch of the imagination. So I guess my wife, Lindsay, could also say what I just said. You know, she'd be like, Dan, I didn't want to fuck that personal trainer. I had to. I needed to. It's evolution. Damn it, Lucifina. Uh, as you might imagine, the Coolidge effect has important implications for our romantic relationships, especially long-term monogamous relationships. You know, in particular, it suggests that declining sexual interest in a long-term partner and being excited by variety is probably to be expected rather than a sign that there's something wrong with you or your relationship. So what can a couple do to combat this potential decrease in sexual interest? Well, you can start having sex with other people. Swing, baby, swing! I can fuck the neighbor. Lindsay can fuck the trainer. Problem solved. Uh, no, that is obviously one way to kick your libido back up. Uh, and it doesn't work you know, for a lot of people for obvious reasons. Jealousy, insecurity. What if my partner leaves me for the new person? Fear of STDs, etc. So another way to combat the Coolidge effect is to try new things like spanking. Now we're back to spankings. Everything always circles back to spankings. That's the main takeaway from this episode. Life is spankings. Print that. No. But seriously, novelty in all forms, not just new partners, can breed sexual excitement. As some evidence of this research has found that the long-term couples who report having the most intense feelings for each other are those who engage in the most new and exciting activities together. In other words, you could potentially stimulate the same level of sexual excitement that you might receive from a new partner by just bringing more novelty into your existing relationship. Uh, so clearly this Coolidge effect could explain a lot of people's interest in various types of kink. Why get spanked? Why, uh, you know, you know, cause uh, why get, uh, you know, whipped, whatever. Why, why have a lady dressed in latex push you, uh, you know, to the ground and then make you eat dog food without using your hands and tell you you're a nasty little piggy and then tie you up and take your temperature with a rectal thermometer, even though you've made it very clear that you don't feel feverish and you just want to go home? Uh, no, because you're fucking bored. You know, because your brain, not just your dick or your pussy, is hardwired to want to try new things, to enjoy trying new things. 
Uh, there's a region in our meat sac midbrains called the uh, substa substantia nigra, ventral segmental area, or SNVTA. It contains dopamine-producing nerve cells. And again, dopamine, you know, one of the feel-good chemicals in our brain, uh, interacting with the pleasure and reward center of our brain, dopamine, along with other chemicals like serotonin um, and endorphins, you know, play, plays a vital, vital role in how happy we feel. And this SNVTA is essentially the major novelty center of our brain. It responds to novel stimuli. The SNVTA closely linked to areas of the brain called the hippocampus and the amygdala, both of which play large roles in learning and memory. The hippocampus compares stimuli against existing memories, while the amygdala responds to emotional stimuli and strengthens associated long-term memories. And some researchers did a study using an MRI to monitor how the brains of different subjects reacted to being exposed to images they had not seen before, that they didn't have memories of, you know? Uh, or, sorry, you know, there was those Im images, you know, ones they hadn't seen before versus images they had seen before. And they discovered that dopamine pathways in the SNVTA are activated for sure when we're exposed to novelty. You know, and it makes sense to me. I love learning something new. That's literally the main reason I started this podcast back in 2016 to learn something new. Hail Nimra. Trying something new like spanking can be fun just because it's new. Uh, can it also, in some cases, be deviant? Can longing for a savage ass spanking be related to past sexual trauma? Can it be related to childhood sexual abuse? Yeah, I mean, in some cases, sure. But important to know that in what seems to be the overwhelming majority of cases, getting kinky doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you uh, at all. Hence the term kink shame. Uh, it doesn't mean it has anything to do with your childhood. It can just mean you're adventurous, that you like letting go of control. Uh, or, you know, who the fuck cares? It just feels good. Stop overanalyzing all of this and just let me come in peace. Uh, important to note. That being kinky, though, doesn't mean you're damaged. If you want to get spanked because you truly hate yourself and you think you're a worthless piece of shit, a naughty boy or a naughty girl, and you need a good whooping, you know, and that's what actually happened to you as a kid, then yeah, you should get some therapy. But if you just like the way it feels, if you just like letting go, just enjoy it. It's hot as fuck. Um, and people more educated than me think it's healthy. Okay, so now that we understand the motivation for at least uh, many when it comes to kink, what other forms of kink are out there? According to that survey of more than 2018 and older, mostly heterosexual adults I was talking about that, that led us to spanking, 6.3% of men, 5.2% of women have gone to a swingers party at some point in their lifetime. 11.5% of men, 6.3% of women have engaged in group sex with a group of four or more people. And 17.8% of dudes and 10.3% of women have been in a threesome. Damn it. Missed out on that. Uh, missed out on the threesome. And now that ship may have sailed. Lindsay and I, I think are both too jealous to give that one a go. I used to joke around, uh, you know, about it with Lindsay, but, but if we ever had another woman come into bed with us, I would be so nervous about Lindsay getting either sad or angry that I wouldn't be able to do anything. I, I'd be way too in my head. It, it would end, it would end with Lindsay having some big heart to heart with, you know, Lindsay and I having a big heart to heart, uh, one or both of us crying. And then the third person just awkwardly putting their clothes back on, slipping out quietly, and then telling all their friends about the two fucking lunatics they'd went home with. Uh, and zero interest in bringing in another dude. Uh, we have a one dick bedroom capacity. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's just only room for one dick in here. Get out of here. Uh, you got to have the right psychological makeup and relationship dynamic to pull off a threesome and not destroy the relationship. I know plenty of people can pull it off. Uh, I don't, I'm not one of them. Um, okay. So let's, uh, so let's group sex. What other types of kink are out there? <laughs> there is one I've always kind of been fascinated with. Uh, cuckolding. Uh, yeah, there's cuckolding. Traditionally, cuckolding is when a heterosexual couple agrees to both explore the turn on of the female sleeping with other men, specifically in order to to uh, humiliate her male partner. Not for me, but some people love it. Some people have a good uh, shame boner going on. What is big deal? What is shame boner? I thought shame only for soft limp shame cock. No, no, chica deal. Shame isn't just for the limp. Sometimes shame is for the hard. Oh, thank, thank you, Sock Master. Never think like that. More, more you know. Ah, you bet you could deal. No worries, buddy. No, according to a study, though, published in late 2017, acting on cuckolding fantasies can be a largely positive experience for many couples and not a, a sign of weakness. The emotions surrounding seeing your partner with someone else can add to the turn-on, explained uh, one of the researchers, saying, it's not cuckolding if there isn't an element of humiliation, de uh, degradation, or denial. Our erotic imaginations have the ability to turn shame lemons into delicious kink lemonade. Overall, the research team found that for the most part, cuckolding tends to be a positive fantasy and behavior. Another researcher said it doesn't appear to be evidence of disturbance of an unhealthy relationship 
or of disregard for one's partner. But there's an important caveat, the researchers added, uh, saying we found several personality factors that predict more positive experiences acting on cuckolding fantasies. For those who have a lot of relationship anxiety or abandonment issues, who lack intimacy and communication, who aren't careful, detail-oriented planners, acting on a consensual non-monogamy fantasy could very well be a negative experience. In other words, not everyone who has a cuckolding fantasy should think about acting on it. Next, kink. Have you ever heard of somnophilia? Ever fall asleep and then wake up to your partner's genitals inside one of your holes? Well, you're with someone who has a strong case of somnophilia. Somnophilia, sometimes referred to as sleeping beauty syndrome, is defined as getting arousal from a person who is seemingly asleep or unconscious. This kind of fetish also involves an exchange of power where the person awake is in a dominant position. The key with this fetish, obviously, is consent. Don't pull a Bill Cosby here. Consent important with all fetishes. This isn't one where you follow the thought of, oh, it's better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. No. Uh, do not follow that saying's logic with anything sexual. If you do follow uh, that logic in the bedroom, you're, you're probably a rapist. Baby, why are you so mad? I know. I know you don't want me to stick it in your butt. When you're awake, duh. I always thought that meant you just didn't like it when you're awake. That's why I thought it would be fun to try to sneak it in when you fell asleep. Now I know. Everyone makes mistakes. Uh, somnophilia can fall under the larger kink category of role play. Next kink, let's talk about consensual voyeurism. Consensual voyeurism involves consensually observing others undress, have sex, or engage in other sexual acts. This isn't, be, uh, isn't to be confused with spying on people without their consent, which is definitely inappropriate and uh, illegal. Consensual voyeurism isn't about consenting to spy on people. It's about getting their consent. So that's, you know, that's important. You know, you can't just give yourself permission to spy on people. O officer, why am I being arrested? I agreed to do this. I gave my consent. Listen, listen, I said, Dan, it's okay. You can watch that lady across the street shower. I give you permission to climb up that maple tree with a long lens camera after dark and see her put a nice little lather on those big old titties and get them so very clean. I, I says to myself, Dan, it's fine. Put your hand in your pants, crank one out. No one will see the branch bobbing up and down. It's okay. No, you have to get the other person's consent. In this scenario, the person you're observing should enjoy being watched. Uh, and they might even be put on a show. This can include watching a partner masturbate, going to a strip club together, uh, watching live cam videos together, et cetera. Uh, consensual voyeurism typically takes place at a swingers party or at a play party, parties where people participate in BDSM activities. Next kink, urophilia. Uh, th this is the fetish for people who are sexually aroused by being urinated on, also known as water sports. Often there is a BDSM element at work here too. Uh, the person getting peed on is clearly submissive to the people doing the peeing. Or the person, doesn't have to be, I don't know why I added fucking multiple there, why it's a group all of a sudden. Uh, but having someone's pee drip you know, down your body might evoke some feelings of humiliation, which can be a turn on for some people, similar to you know what we talked about with cuckolding. Man, man, I gotta say, uh, this is a fetish that I feel like would really piss you off if you had like an enemy. Like what if you had an enemy you hated so much? You would fantasize for years about beating the shit out of them. And ideally, you wanna beat the shit out of them, and then when they're down on the ground after a good beating, you want to just fucking piss on them. And then what if you had the chance to do that, right? You're living out your, your, their fantasy against your lifelong enemy, someone who had done horrible shit to you, right? They burned your house down, like extreme stuff. They tried to kill your parents, all kinds of super bad stuff. They deserve it. You finally beat the shit out of them, only discover that the more you beat them, the, the bigger a boner they get, right? They're, you find out, oh man, they're a huge sexual masochist. And they start pissing on them and they come. You're like, God damn it. Ah, you're, you're, you're a philia fetish. That's so frustrating. I'm not supposed to enjoy this. But an inter interesting thing. Yeah, some people enjoy peeing on others. Some people enjoy being peed on. Uh, a lot of interesting fetishes and kinks. Next kink, macrophilia. Now we're getting more niche. Even more than being peed on. Uh, macrophilia is the sexual attraction to giants or giantesses. Apparently the porn industry has seen increased consumption for this type of porn recently. Particularly arousing niches within this sexual interest include being squished against a giant's breasts. <laughs> Sorry. Some of the stuff, being crushed by a giant, uh, being dominated by a giant, or being physically harmed by a giant. Though some macrophiles may be attracted to real people that are several feet taller for them. Man, it'd be a, it'd be a bitch to be like a seven foot tall macrophile. Uh, macrophilia is typically more about the imagination. Uh, most macrophile porn is animated. Virtual reality or CGI porn. Uh, porn for those who enjoy imagining and fantasizing about being vulnerable and small and powerless against a huge giant. Now I'm starting to feel pretty vanilla. 
Never once have I thought about how hot it would be to have some giant angry woman smash my head in between her, her huge giant breasts. Olga hates Tiny Dan. Olga smash head with thunder boobs. Why Tiny Dan have tiny boner? I mean, not, you know, too tiny, normal, somewhat proportionally to body size, but tiny for me, for I am angry, tall woman. You know, you get it. Uh, next kink, there's uh, actromof- <laughs> actra, oh my gosh. Acrotomophilia, a sexual interest in amputees. In a survey of actrotomophiles, uh, and yes, this group is big enough to be surveyed, Leg amputations were preferred over arm amputations, amputations of a single limb over double amputations, and amputations that left a stump over amputations that left no stump. That's very specific, man. Very specific taste. I feel like if you have this fetish, um, man, you have to end up doing a fuck ton of swiping on whatever hookup app you're using. If you're looking for somebody, just hour after hour, like, no, 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 nope, 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 oh, maybe, nope, 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 nope. Oh, damn, oh, damn. Oh, stump. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, then there was the very rare climacophilia, which, <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> climacophilia is a fetish where the subject experiences erotic gratification when falling down the stairs. I'm not fucking kidding. And I'm not trying to kink shame, but God damn it. You legitimately might want to see a therapist for this one. Like, like think about it. Come on. If you need to throw, <laughs> if you need to throw yourself down the stairs just to come. You might want to talk to somebody. I just, it, that's dangerous. I'm so glad I don't have it. So glad I don't have, I don't, I don't get so horny that I throw myself down the stairs and then I'm just like, I guess what? Laying at the bottom, just jerking off with a sprained wrist or a busted arm, all banged up and bleeding on the landing. Uh, there's coprophilia. This is arousal to feces. Show bitch, piping out that hot, fresh peanut butter. That's how I do it in Hollywood. Uh, Carapophilia is the attraction to the smell, taste, texture, or sight and sounds of the act of defecation as a primary means of sexual arousal and gratification. I'm going to definitely kink shame part of this. This is medically not, not sound. This is, <laughs> this is bad. This is bad. I mean, if the attraction folks is on eating the shit, I mean, if you need to smell some shit while you masturbate, I guess, whatever, you know, fine. You're not hurting anyone. You're not hurting yourself. Huge turn off for me to smell something like that, but whatever, if you like it, you know, but if you want someone to literally shit in your mouth, no bueno, consuming one's own feces could have potentially harmful consequences as bowel bacteria are not necessarily safe to ingest, even riskier to eat someone else's shit. I love that I have to say that as seriously. Uh, risks include viral hepatitis, parasitic intestinal infections, and many others. Uh, and, and a terrible time right now to start acting on this sexual impulse, if you have it. Do not end up in an ICU bed because you got COVID-19 because you ate someone else's shit. Next kink. There's exhibitionism, arousal from displaying one's genitals in public. And this one's tricky. This one's tricky because if you flash your junk to strangers, it's illegal. You might want to see a therapist about this one too before you go to jail for, for flashing people. I mean, you could get permission, but I feel like that defeats the entire point of flashing somebody. I, I feel like this kink is a great one for someone uh, to have who spends a lot of time in hotel rooms, right? Right, you just keep, you know, accidentally leaving the lights on. You, you keep forgetting to close the blinds. Whoopsie. Oh, man, just keep forgetting. You're butt naked right in front of the window. I totally didn't even realize that you, that you know, you, you, you tucked your dick in between your legs and that you're dancing to cue Lazarus's goodbye horses. Would, would you fuck me? I'd fuck me hard. I'd fuck me so hard. Uh, Science of the Lambs reference if you're confused right now. Uh, next kink. Next kink. Kink? Kink? Kink. Uh, there's nasolingus, a sexual attraction to sucking on someone's nose. All right? Not for me. But if you want to suck the fuck out of a consenting adult's nose, well, you get after it. You get that nose. You suck that snoz. You bang that beak. You hunker down on that honker. Uh, next kink, there is titilagnia. This is a tickle fetish. Uh, you get turned on by tickling someone? Well, Congratulations. You have a fetish that makes most people want to punch you in the fucking throat. Super annoying. If Lindsay had this and couldn't control it, I would have to leave her. Right? No, do not fucking tickle me. If you have uh, titilagnia, you need to get online and you need to look for somebody who has nismalagnia. Uh, That's someone who is aroused by being tickled. Perfect. Match made in tickle fetish heaven, which sounds like a weird lame heaven. Um, there's so many other fetishes. There's neblophilia, arousal by smoke or fog, 
there's the very strange uh, melissophilia, a sexual attraction to bees, wasps, and other stinging insects. Keep, keep stinging, bumblebee. Oh, you don't you stop. Don't you stop till daddy comes. Uh, there's lithophilia, a sexual attraction to stone and gravel. Mmm, damn. Man, look at that sexy ass gravel. God damn, that's some fine ass granite. Mmm, slap my dick on that shell. Mm, fuck that limestone so hard. Uh, there's autoplacophilia, getting turned on when you dress up like a giant cartoon stuffed animal. Dude, I'm telling you. I put on that giant teddy bear costume with the fucking butterfly wings. My dick turns into a cum faucet. Uh, there's also the rare but totally normal, to totally normal uh, nanopilolingus. This is a strong desire to fuck nanopils. Strong desire to be a total alpha male fruit fucker. I don't know if this one is real or not. Uh, but I did talk about having sex with a banana peel in a bathroom of a grocery store I worked at in high school. Uh, on my new stand-up special, I know I talked about it on the podcast before. And apparently, I'm not the only one who's done this. Numerous men and women have told me after sh shows or written in messages uh, about sexually pleasuring themselves in some way with a banana. And I got a lot of emails about this happening. Uh, and I got a lot of emails about uh, some doctors uh, online who heard about this so much that they got concerned and they spoke out about how it's not a good idea. <laughs> Seriously. Some doctors have been warning horny men not to masturbate into banana peels after a number of men in online chat rooms and on Reddit threads, et cetera, have admitted to putting bananas in the microwave and then fucking the warm, mushy inside of the banana. Some men insist that the slimy peel interior makes a good lubricant and stimulates the feelings or simulates the feeling of oral sex. I bet it does. Doctors, though, have said that this act can cause sores, rashes, and infections as the protein in the fruit skin can cause flare-ups in some people especially on the extra sensitive skin of the penis. One online doctor, Dr. Diana Gill from a service called Doctor For You also warned a person with a banana allergy is more likely to be allergic to other substances such as latex or other fruits and vegetables. So if you're allergic to latex condoms, you may also be allergic to banana skins. Although rare, you could develop a rash and sores on the penis, which can be painful and can lead to infection. And in extremely rare cases, your dick can turn yellow, develop black spots, and if you don't get it treated, it can turn completely dark, fall off, and if you're not careful, your aunt can find it and bake it into some bread. Of course, I'm kidding about that. One last kink. It's a big one. Let's talk about pony play. Oh, my heck! What is pony play? It's a type of role play and also a type of BDSM. In almost all pony play situations, the owner or trainer, trainer that seems to be the common term, is played by the dominant, and the submissive is the pony. Ponies are often known as pony girls or pony boys. Uh, like many forms of sexual role play, the participants may adopt, adopt nicknames that they uh, use, you know, while participating. Within pony play culture, uh, you know, trainers and ponies um, have names and you may only know other pony players by these names, you know, that they come up with for the role play. Like, like if Lindsay and I were playing and she was the pony, uh, you know, and I was a trainer, I could be, say, Captain Whiskerhorn and she could be Sarsaparilla Spunkmeister. And then, and then, you know, if she was like, Dan, can you pass me some water? I could just ignore her. You know what I mean? Dan, seriously, pass me some water. Ah, da, 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 da. Oh, for fuck's sake. Can I please have some water, Captain Whiskerhorn? Yes, Sarsaparilla Spunkmeister. But only if you nay first. Only after you take a bite of this carrot. Be a good pony. Uh, pony play shares much, but not all of its aesthetic with BDSM gear and costumes. Black leather. Uh, PVC <laughs> suede commonly used for items both worn and wielded during a pony play session or event. Uh, corsets also sometimes worn as part of intricate pony costumes. And there is uh, oh so much more pony play uh, pony person gear you can buy for your for your very own Sarsaparilla Spunkmeister. Easy girl, easy girl. Uh, reins to direct your pony. Uh, you can get saddles for riders to perch on and actually ride another human being. <laughs> You can get bits that go into a pony's mouth for control and, you know, uh, to control, you know, like noises, uh, tongue ports to hold down their tongue, bridles to attach to your uh, pony to allow the trainer to control their horse. Whoa, Sarsaparilla. Easy girl. Easy girl. Uh, martingales to connect the bridles to a belt, uh, a harness that can connect a pony to a cart, collars for your pony you can get, uh, hoof boots, hoof boots uh, worn on the legs and feet to give the impression of hooves. Uh, <laughs> You get hoof mitts, you know, same thing for the hands. You can get polos, wraps, uh, you know, the wrap around the, the, the pony's legs, often over the hoof boots, boots to add support, restrict movement, you know, just for looks. Uh, masks to cover the pony's head, you know, you can have like a snout, you know, ears and mane. 
Body suits can incorporate, you know, masks, tails, and manes. Uh, tails can be uh, also uh, pony anal plugs with like an attached tail. Uh, pony ears. Uh, blinders to block the pony's peripheral vision, you know. Uh, whoa, Sarsaparilla. Focus, focus, girl. You have to, uh, do you want me, hey, hey, you want me to put the blinders back on? Or are you going to fucking pay attention? Uh-huh. Uh, wrist or ankle restraints, you know, just like real ponies wear. <laughs> you can get plumes to sit on top of the uh, of the head of the sex pony during shows and events. Hobbles, restraints worn uh, between the calves to limit movement. You can get brushes for the pony's fur. Crops for giving your pony direction during training or punishment. You can even get spurs. Some trainers <laughs> will wear spurs to help train a stubborn pony. Sarsaparilla, do not buck. Do not make me get the spurs out, Sarsaparilla Spunkmeister. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are specialty retailers that can custom make this stuff. You can spend thousands of dollars on pony play gear, and there's so much more to it. Uh, the pony trainer spends time training their pony. Uh, there, there's different types of ponies. You can, you can be a work pony, a breeding pony, riding pony, show pony, event pony, st straight up pleasure pony. Uh, there's all kinds of pony training guides online. Tell you how to break your wild pony. God, fucking sarsaparilla, I feel like, is a horse that's going to have a tough spirit. You know, how to punish your pony. Pfft. Yeah, but hell yeah. I need to read about a thousand of those guides. I got a fucking wild loose cannon with old sarsaparilla. Uh, you know, there's stuff about how to tie your pony up. And, you know, there's guys to how to, how to fuck that naughty pony. Sometimes you got to fuck your naughty pony. Gosh, gosh dang, sarsaparilla. Uh, you can take the role play even further. You can bring... <laughs> ah, I know this is real for some people, but... You can bring a fake vet into the mix. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can have a group sex situation. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, one person's a trainer, uh, one person's, one person's a pony and another person's a vet, you know, you got a sick, you got a sick pony. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> I'm being so inappropriate. I don't know why my brain went to Joe Paisley. Ah, oh, Dr. Joe. Oh, sarsaparilla's got something wrong with your butt. She's got something in there. Oh, I can't, I can't see it. Oh man. Please, please. Uh, where's your vet tools? I mean, if you don't have any tools, I guess I'll just have to feel around with my, my ween. You know what I mean? Serious pony plays more than just a kink. It's a fucking lifestyle. And, uh, and I don't want a kink shame. I really don't. If you enjoy pony play, I don't give a shit. Good for you. You only live once. I would just be lying though. If I, if I tried to not like pretend that I just didn't think this shit was hilarious. Like I was laughing my ass off watching pony play videos. It's so funny to me. Just like watching a bunch of pony players, uh, all together, uh, and this one video made me think of like a, a super perverted Renaissance fair. Is that kind of vibe? It was this video called Ponies on the Delta Pony Play Festival in New Orleans. And it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my fucking life. But keep riding, pony people. Keep, keep letting that freak, freak flag fly. Okay, so let's recap what we've learned so far. Uh, in America, blowjobs and anal sex are a lot more common now than they were in the 40s and 50s, but people were still getting freaky back then. And cheating... Uh, pain for sex seems to be down quite a bit compared to the forties and fifties. Premarital sex is way up, but as far as overall sexual morals, you know, when people are like, oh man, things are falling to shit. Nah, I don't think, you know, things are any more perverted now than they were back in the days of leave it to beaver, you know, and all that. And, and really what even is perverted? It's so subjective. What's perverted to one is, uh, vanilla to another. One man's pony play is another man's missionary, right? You get it. Are people more into kink now than they were over half a century ago? Uh, we don't know. Uh, maybe. If kink is more popular now, and we do know that, uh, uh, or we do know that most of it is uh, completely harmless and probably a whole lot of fun. You know, wanting to be tied up, choked, spanked, play dress up, etc., cetera, uh, does not mean that there is anything wrong with you. You might just like to try something new. You might just be less worried about what society thinks, you know, uh, less worried about what people think is taboo and more willing to do whatever makes you feel good. And as long as that is consensual and isn't going to make you physically ill, well, fucking good on you. You hop on your own sarsaparilla spunk miser and you fucking ride like the wind. You know what I mean? Uh, okay, next up. What is, what is the rest of the world up to sexually? Uh, let's talk about that uh, right after a quick word from today's sponsors. And again, thank you for using our sponsors and letting them know you heard about them uh, you know, through us. Thanks for using our unique URLs and discount codes so uh, the sponsors know that we sent you there. Uh, today's Time Suck is brought to you by the 2020 A-Hole Air Banjo Academy's new online course, Songs to Air Pluck While You Train your pony person. Sometimes you need to take a break from whipping sarsaparilla, you know? Sometimes your, your hand gets sore with all the spanking and 
Sometimes you get sick of the starving and, you know, having to cage your, your naughty pony lady. Uh, so relax, relax and pluck off some, some steam, you know, by playing this, this horse related classic. Mmm, mm-hmm. That's the perfect song to air banjo to when you're, when you're doing some pony playing. Bing, 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 and of course, it's not a sponsor. I've just had that song in my head all damn day, and it makes me laugh. I want to play it the whole episode. I've been fighting it just all episode long. I just want to just push that button again. Just... Okay, I'll stop. Uh, that was the William Tell Overture, by the way, the Lone Ranger theme song. And when I hear it, I think of horses. And now when you hear it, you're going to think about pony play. You're welcome. Here are today's real sponsors. And I'm back. Or if you're watching on YouTube, I never even left. Uh, what I started wondering as I looked into America's sexual interests was how, did, how does the U.S. stack up against the rest of the world? A U.K. online doctor sexual wellness website called Dr. Felix gathered data from various sexual studies uh, done around the, the globe in recent years. Let me share some interesting tidbits. The major English-speaking nations of the UK, USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, for example, share more than just a mother tongue. They're also where you'll find the most sexually adventurous people on the planet. English speakers like to get kinky. More people have used a blindfold or masks during sex in these countries than anywhere else in the world. More English speakers use lube than in other countries. Far more English speakers use vibrators. The trend is reflected in shopping habits. More Google searches for sex toys come up from these nations than from any other nations. Australians may be the most sexually liberated people on the planet. 22% of Australians have shared an intimate moment uh, with somebody of the same sex compared with the global average of just 12%. 17% of Americans report having same sex experiences. The Danes lead the world in cheating. A whopping 46% of Danish, Danish people say they've had an extramarital affair compared to roughly 25% of Americans. Uh, anal sex is so common in Greece right now that many Europeans refer to anal sex, according to this, uh, you know, Dr. Felix, as doing it Greek. A report titled Sexual Behavior, Sexual Attraction, and Sexual Identity in the United States, which reportedly polled thousands of people between the ages of 15 and 44 from 2006 to 2008, reported that 44% of straight men, 36% of straight women admitted to having anal sex at least once, but 55% of Greeks, taking into account men and women, have tried anal sex at least once. Uh, despite being the home of Kama Sutra, right, the ancient Indian Sanskrit text of sexuality, eroticism, and emotional fulfillment, India seems to be one of the least sexually adventurous nations on earth right now. Two-thirds of sexually active Indians reported never having tried anal sex, a threesome, or to have using uh, a sexual aid of any kind at any point. However, India is also one of the most sexually satisfied nations on earth, which I find interesting. 61% say they're fully satisfied with their sexual lives, uh, beating, uh, beaten only by Nigeria and Mexico. Uh, what country is the least sexually satisfied? Japan. Only 10% of Japanese people report having exciting sex. That's a, what a bummer. Uh, Japanese women are so beautiful too. Uh, only 34% of Japanese folk reported having sex weekly. The next lowest rate is actually the United States. Damn it. 53% of Americans report having weekly sex. Who's doing it the most? Italians. And this, and this came out before the, the quarantine stuff. This isn't because of recent events. 76% of Italians report having sex weekly. I like it to princess a pizza. I like it to give them a bowser wowser. Here we go. Uh, what country has the most sexually liberated women? According to another study I found, New Zealand. Yay, Kiwis. Kiwi women, according to this study, have an average of 20.4 sexual partners in their lifetime. That's three times over the global average of 7.3, double the averages of British and Australian women. The average U.S. woman, according to uh, one study, uh, I found only four. And I got to say that number feels very low to me. Uh, I will say that numbers vary pretty wildly from study to study when it comes to the number of sexual partners, especially uh, uh, the ones that women are claiming. Back to the Dr. Felix study. That study looked at what men and women sexually fantasize about around the world. 
interesting results. Here are the most common, according to this assessment of various sex studies, male fantasies, most common male fantasies. 88% fantasize about a blowjob. 85% fantasize about sex with two women. 83% fantasize about sex with somebody that they know who is not their partner. And 82% fantasize about sex in an unusual place. Now let's compare this with women. Uh, what do women fantasize the most about around the world? 100% of straight uh, and bisexual women fantasize about constant and aggressive anal pounding. I fucking knew it. I knew it. 100% of straight and bisexual women fantasize also about sharing their man with multiple women. Okay, interesting. 100% of women want less foreplay, less talk, and they want to buy a one-way express ticket to quote Bone Town. Choo choo! All aboard! One way express heading to Bone Town for some pounding! Uh, hey, Lucifina. Of course, I made that shit up. <laughs> for real, though, what do women, straight women in this case, around the world fantasize about the most sexually, according to Dr. Felix? 85% fantasize about sex in a romantic location, 82% fantasize about sex in an unusual place, uh, 76% fantasize about receiving oral sex. And 72% fantasize about performing oral sex on a man. So many oral sex fantasies. Uh, that settles it. We live in a fantastic world. Uh, now let's talk about porn. Let's talk about porn. And then let's talk about robots. You heard me. Uh, then we have more pony play to get back into. Not even joking. Uh, then I'm going to interview the queen of the suck. Get a female perspective on all this sex. And I promise before it's all over, squirting will be addressed. People want to hear the squirt. Um... That was a weird way to phrase that. Okay, let's talk about porn. How does porn affect our sex lives? Uh, porn has been around a long, long time in some form. But I think this is important to think about. Prior to the invention and proliferation of VCRs in the late 70s, very few people were ever watching porn. Very, very few young men and women were watching a video of other people have sex before they had sex themselves. Important to note that. Uh, Playboy magazine did not come out until the very end of 1953. And it was very tame by today's standards. Artsy nude pics, no sex acts, didn't even show pubic hair at first. No leg spread, no close-up waxed and bleached butthole shots. Penthouse got a little racier when they hit the shelves in 1965, but still very tame by today's standards for many, many years. Hustler came out in 1974, and it was the first mainstream, truly hardcore porn pick magazine. Semen, anal, pen anal penetration are shown. Penthouse didn't show any of that until 1998. Uh, and, and porn wasn't accessible to every kid with, uh, you know, uh, a computer and a phone like it was, like they, like it is now, you know, for, for so long, it was still images, you know, when, when the internet first came around, not 4k video where it looks like you're looking through a window and watching two people, you know, or, or, or way more than two people have sex right in front of you. Uh, in the 1960s, there was only 20 adult movie theaters in the U S showing grainy, cheaply produced, horribly lit, soft core, 35 millimeter pornos. Adult theaters would never be more, you know, very popular, uh, everywhere in America. Porn was never truly a huge part of the world's sexual culture until the internet uh, and until porn showed up on the internet. The first porn website didn't show up until 1994, sex.com. And it was mostly shitty, low resolution still images, right? That took forever to load again on, the, on your AOL dial-up connection. Despite the technical limitations compared to today, 450,000 pornographic images were posted online in 1994. Accessed approximately 6.4 million times. And it is, it's just crazy to me that, that less than 30 years ago, that's when porn hit the web. You know, that people have been regularly watching hardcore porn at home for less than 50 years. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that our brains were not being constantly bombarded by porn. In the late 90s, I remember hearing about people going to porn sites on the computer for the first time. In the early 2000s, I was still buying the occasional porn Mac. You know, it, it was still hot to have access to like 10 new pictures. Now, 20% of all mobile web searches are for porn. One in five of every search on a, on a mobile device is for porn. 13% of all web searches total. 4% of all websites are porn. According to a 2011 Cosmopolitan study called A Billion Wicked Thoughts, 87% of US men between the ages of 18 and 35 look at porn on a weekly basis on the web, right? 2017 alone, Pornhub got 28.5 billion visits. In 2018, Pornhub got 33.5 billion visits. Also in 2018, 109 billion, uh, over 109 billion videos were watched on Pornhub. 
Over 14 videos watched for every person on the entire planet. And that's one porn site, one of many. According to Pornhub's own site, visiting Pornhub is a daily routine for more than 120 million people. And since the worldwide shelter-in-place measures began, viewing has increased dramatically on Pornhub across the world uh, by over 61% in Spain, over 38% in France. At one point, it was increased by over uh, 57% in Italy. So much porn. And like I established at the beginning of this episode, all kinds of porn. Every fetish we talked about today and so many more. Hundreds of thousands of videos. Millions of images. What is all that porn doing to us? What's it doing to our brains? More and more studies are coming out linking high rates of porn consumption and young men in particular to a decrease in overall sexual libido and also to erectile dysfunction. Why? Well, the answer to this question makes a lot of sense to me. For many young people growing up with vast amounts of porn that we now have online, people just hitting adulthood now and in the past 10 or so years, uh, or you know, for the past 10 or so years, uh, these are the people, the first people in the history of earth to grow up in a world saturated with porn. These people, many of them, you know, at least grew up masturbating to unlimited porn that's uh, offered today. All of that porn was their first introduction to sex. Their only blueprint for sexual interaction came from watching porn stars have sex. Porn stars are performers. They're acting. That can be a very hard act to follow in real life. Like, think about that. If you're watching video after video of muscled up dudes with penises that are in the upper five or 1% of the biggest dicks on the planet, Guys with these donkey dicks are having sex with multiple women with perfectly aligned labia, perky, you know, uh, symmetrical breasts, tiny, small waist, peach-shaped asses, flawless skin. They're having sex with women who beg for every male-centric fantasy ever. They want their partner to stick it in their ass with no warm-up, you know, it's because that's not that's not shown. It's edited out. You know, these women want to, uh, you know, give these guys blowjobs with a few of their friends at the same time. They want to bend willingly into 10 different positions, no questions asked. I want to share this guy with their with their friends. He orgasms across all their chests. It's all shot in 4K, shot in a Hollywood Hills mansion. It's well lit. Everyone looks healthy, happy, and super horny. It's a fantasy. It's a fantasy, but your adolescent brain processes it as reality. Or if it doesn't process that video as reality, it does process thousands and thousands of other videos labeled as quote unquote amateur videos that are not amateur. It's it's the same thing. It's porn stars on porn sets. And then that same brain is then looking at the, the reality around them, right? It's, it's seeing their average size penis. It's looking in the mirror, seeing maybe, uh, I don't know, an extra 10, 20, 30 pounds being carried. This brain is looking at the, their partner. She, you know, she doesn't have six pack abs. She's not always, you know, perfectly waxed and bleached. Maybe she doesn't have perfectly perky 19 year old breasts or brand new fake breasts. She doesn't have a lighting kit on her, tons of makeup, new lingerie and heels. She doesn't want to invite her friends into the mix. She doesn't want you to cram it in her ass with no warm up. She wants to have some foreplay and your brain thinks, what the fuck? This isn't what the girls in the videos were doing. This isn't as good. I don't look like that guy in the video. I'm not as good. You know, and, and, and your, the guy's libido drops, sense of reality has been distorted. Now he has a poor body image, performance anxiety. Maybe he's in his head. This all adds up to a really shitty real life sex life. More and more studies are showing that too much porn fucks up your real life sex life because it just can't compete. According to a 2014 study in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, one out of every four new erectile dysfunction patients is under 40. Extensive research from Holland has noted a sharp increase in the level uh, level of erectile dysfunction rates amongst young men in the last half century in Europe. Back in 2001, 2002, erectile dysfunction rates for men were almost negligible. But by 2011, ED rates in young Europeans age 18 to 40 ranged from 14 to 28%. Huge jump from, you know, uh, you know, negligible levels, you know, one less than 1% to 28% in places. The Institute of Human Development in Berlin undertook a study examining the likely link between porn addiction and ED by examining the effect porn has on desensitizing the human brain. The 2014 study of 65 healthy men proved that watching internet pornography for just four hours each week decreases the amount of gray matter in your brain. The part involved in sensory perception, such as seeing, hearing, memory, emotion, speech, etc., They found less neurons and neuron connectivity in the pleasure center of the brain after monitoring male porn habits compared to the brains of those who didn't watch any of it at all. Too much porn seems to leave the brain craving more explicit material while making it harder and harder for the same images and also for sex in real life to provide the same stimulation. Porn addicts are then more likely to seek out more deviant sexual images to satisfy their cravings and to become, you know, really kind of hardcore porn addicts. Remember when I talked about the Coolidge effect earlier? How you can stimulate your brain and ignite your sexual interest by having sex with a new partner or trying something new in bed. Well, what if you can just fucking burn out that part of your brain? 
the SNBTA that we talked about earlier, the novelty center of your brain, the part that responds to novel stimuli by kicking out that dopamine, right? What if you can just burn it out because you've seen everything new? I think of it like, like I love devil's food cake, rich, dark chocolate frosty on top of rich, dark chocolate cake. And I like the Betty Crocker version right out of the box. Delicious. I don't have it very often. Part of the reason I like it so much is because it's special. It's, it's not the, something I constantly taste. But what if I ate devil's food cake every day for several months? And what if every time I ate it, I had a slice from a cake that had just been made by one of the world's best chocolate cake makers, right? The finest dark chocolate cake made from scratch by the best cake makers in the biz using the finest artesian flour, if that's even a thing, other amazing best you can use ingredients. And then right after all that, now I'm offered a slice of Betty Crocker cake again. Am I going to like it as much as I used to? Fuck no, that's not how the brain works. It's not made by one of the best cake makers in the biz. It can't compete in that sense. And now I'm tired of chocolate cake. All I've been fucking doing is eating chocolate cake and I'm over it, at least for a while. That's what I think all this porn consumption can do to you. It can burn out, you know, uh, your brain on real sex. I, I know that in my past, when I fell into the habit of looking at porn too often, it for sure fucked up my sex life. I got to a place in my head of just not even caring about sex or not. Because, you know, whatever, I can just go jerk off. It's my favorite fantasy. I can just go eat or virtually eat the best cake ever. Porn, you know, it's hard to compete with in real life. With porn, you don't have to connect to the person you're watching. You don't have to compromise in anything. They're never annoyed with you. You have no baggage with them. They never want you to put on more deodorant or brush your teeth. You can have a sexual relationship of sorts with whoever you're masturbating to that you just cannot have in real life. And it appears as if different, as if this difference between a virtual sex life and a real one is causing some young people to give up on real sex entirely, which is scary. Uh, in Japan, a 2012 sexual survey found that 36% of teenage men and 59% of teenage women, uh, supposedly universally hormone adult population, expressed no interest or were actively turned off by sex. A 19 and 12% increase over 2008 numbers, respectively. So why? No one knows for sure. Let me start with that. But some theorize that a rise in porn consumption, specifically a rise in Japan of, of anime porn consumption, and similar types of porn, uh, porn that doesn't feature actual human beings is the root. Why? Because real human women, real human dudes, cannot compare with somebody who's animated. Like biologically, cannot compare, cannot do the things an illustrator can animate some character to do. So yeah, porn can be bad. And what about the porn stars themselves? Uh, are many of them being exploited, you know, risking STDs, and unwanted pregnancies, being paid next to nothing? Yeah, sometimes. Of course, there is a dark underbelly to the adult film world. Uh, what about sexual assault? Now, does that, uh, you know, um, with, with, uh, lead to more rapes? Like, does, does more violent looking porn lead to more rapes? Well, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence says, very surprisingly to me, no. Their website points out that men who commit rape and men who don't commit rape both view pornography. Milton Diamond, the director of the Pacific Center for Sex and Society at the University of Hawaii, says there's absolutely no evidence that pornography does anything negative. Although uh, the statistics vary, one 2016 report said that 77% of Americans view pornography at least once a month. All right, there was that number that was higher that I threw out earlier. At the same time, sexual assault has decreased by 45% in the last 20 years. And when you take a population adjustment into account, the number shows a decrease of 55%. So if porn leads to sexual assault and there's so much more porn than ever before, why is there so much less sexual assault? Some think that could change soon. In recent years, porn has been accused of becoming increasingly violent. A veteran porn star, Anthony Hardwood, great porn name, uh, said in a recent documentary about porn that in the 1990s, it constituted making love in a bed and having lovey-dovey sex. But in 2010, researchers analyzed more than 300 porn scenes and found that 88% of them contained physical aggression. Most of the perpetrators were male, targets were female. The latter's most common response to aggression was to show pleasure or respond neutrally. Statistics around how violence towards women has become the most commonly viewed porn are alarming. According to Australian adolescent sexuality expert and researcher Marie Crabb, recent analysis of the most popular porn found 88% of scenes included physical aggression, such as gagging, choking, and slapping. 94% of these scenes, uh, the aggression was directed towards women. Women were slapped in 75% of the scenes, verbal aggression in 48% of the scenes. With all of this relatively new aggressive porn, uh, will all of it, you know, lead to possibly more sexual assaults in the future? Time will tell. Some theorize it will lead to less because it provides a fantasy outlet for those who have the desire to commit sexual assaults that might keep them from doing it in real life. 
Just like it's possible to watch in a lot of porn might keep people from having healthy sex in real life. It also might, uh, you know, keep others from having unhealthy, illegal and violent sex in real life. And this brings me back to what we talked about earlier with the, with the incest. Is all the incest porn currently popular going to push more people to commit acts of incest or will it have the opposite effect? Will it allow more people to uh, get it out of their system virtually and not become real life monsters like Joseph Fritzl, world's worst dad we talked about here on Time Sick a while back. Okay, so now, we look mostly at the uh, ways porn can be bad. Can it also be good? You know, according to a 2016 article in The Atlantic, just like I talked about, the ubiquitous of porn has correlated with a drastic decline in sexual abuse towards women. You know, so that that is good. Also, many people watch porn to learn new sexual tricks to try in the bedroom that does make their sex lives better. Uh, I've done that. I hosted the Playboy Morning Show 2015 and 2016, uh, over 100 episodes. All we did was talk about sex. Then I took home you know, some, uh, some tips, Lindsay and I tried them and it was great. Definitely added to our sex life. A 2008 study by researchers, uh, studying hardcore porn's effects on Danish men and women found that respondents construed the viewing of hardcore pornography as beneficial to their sex lives, their attitudes towards sex, their perceptions and attitudes towards members of the opposite sex towards life in general. And, you know, uh, overall found it very satisfying. Uh, viewing porn also can be looked at as a type of sex, safe sex. Unlike real physical sex, watching porn spreads no diseases leads to zero pregnancies. Uh, using porn to satisfy one's sexual needs is, is a safe, free uh, to cheap and, and convenient way to experience sexuality. Porn can actually help foster emotional and sexual intimacy, says psychologist David Schnark, author of Resurrecting Sex, Solving Sexual Problems and Revolutionizing Your Relationship. He says a significant portion of our work in helping couples develop a deeper sexual connection is through erotic images. Erotica, as well as couples' own masturbatory fantasies, can be useful tools for helping them develop as adults. And there's also the view that porn decreases sexual stigma. It leads to less kink shaming, right? It normalizes a variety of sexual behavior and makes people, you know, feel better about what they're doing. You know, makes me think, you know, okay, cool. I'm not the only one doing that. Uh, and here I thought, you know, pony play was making me weird. Saddle up, Sarsaparilla Spunkmeister! It's safe to ride! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Uh, but seriously, there is the argument that helps normalize a variety of sexual activity, you know, and leaves a lot of people feeling better about their desires. Uh, there's also the benefit of helping you figure out what you like in bed, what turns you on. You can learn a lot about your sexual desire via porn before you ever have sex. So now you're hitting the ground running. You can communicate if, if you can communicate effectively, you know, you know what to ask for. So porn recap, is it good or bad? Well, it's both. Uh, it's probably bad to watch too much. It's probably bad to expect your sexual real life to be a series of Pornhub highlights. Probably a, a good place to learn a few tricks. You know, probably a, a great place to not get a new STD, at least if you're not a porn star. And porn is probably a good place to destigmatize formerly taboo sexual behavior. Uh, like most things in life, I feel like the value in porn lies in how you choose to consume it. Okay, now let's talk about sex robots. Uh, let's talk about future sex. Some version of Westworld is coming. I firmly believe this. New robotic sex dolls are being designed, refined, and built as you listen right now, wake up, sheeple. Sex robots are coming. We will fuck them. They will remember, and they will kill us all. Dolores is going to be pissed. But seriously, they're getting more advanced all the time. Facial expressions, movements, look, feel. AI is getting more advanced all the time. You know, they can talk. They can, in a way, think. Someday, I think someday soon, it'll be hard to tell a companion robot, a sex robot apart from a real human. Imagine this not-so-distant future as pointed out in a June 2019 Psychology Today article, a totally realistic robot of your own design that is capable of fully carrying out any sex act that you can dream up. It looks, smells, and sounds incredibly realistic. And your state-sponsored insurance paid for her in full. In effect, she was free, prescribed by your physician to help with your status as, an, as officially sexually dysfunctional. Recent federal legislation supported overwhelmingly by a male majority in the House and Senate has made this kind of medical prescription perfectly legal. Robin the robot never has a headache, never gets a cold, never rejects an advance. It is perhaps strangely beautiful in many respects and surprisingly even seemingly intelligent and witty. Well, according to an expert clinical psychologist and sex therapist, Marianne Brandon, what I've just described is in fact a likely portrait of our near future. In her presentation at the 2009 AEPS Symposium, Applied Evolutionary Psychology Society, Brandon made a strong case suggesting that sex robots are truly in development and on the way, perhaps in a decade or two. Brandon pointed out several potential problems that may well come along with robots. 
uh, men already disproportionately represented as consumers of pornography will likely be overrepresented, overrepresented as consumers of sex robots. Within committed relationships, sexual interactions, which many studies point to being on a nationwide and possibly worldwide decline, will drop further. Intimacy in relationships, which strongly maps onto both quantity and quality of sexual interactions within mateships, likely to drop in quality as well. The prevalence of marriage and birth rates may see declining numbers. Motivation for people to work out relationship problems will be reduced. And in short, you know, the advent of sex robot technology may foreshadow, in many ways, the demise of intimate, uh, intimate relationships in the modern world. Uh, good news about this, we don't have to worry about overpopulation. Bad news, too many senior citizens, not enough young people entering the workforce could create an unprecedented worldwide economic collapse. Things could really suck for basically my kid's generation as they age and the generation under them. You know, if they stop fucking real people. Because then they get old, there's no giant workforce beneath them to keep growing their IRAs and 401ks, no giant workforce, keep growing the world's stock markets and government retirement programs. Then things collapse, but down the road, they get better, less people, more sweet, you know, robot fuck toys. Then eventually the robots figure out how to kill us. Hopefully, before that happens, we figure out how to transfer human organic consciousness into hard drives and clouds before, you know, then we become robots. Then no one needs to fuck anyone and regular humans die. But post-humanism is alive and well. Post-humans are now immortal robot gods with human consciousnesses that can create new organic DNA enhanced carbon-based humans in future Westworld type laboratories. And I'm done now. Because if I don't get out, you know, the sex robot wormhole now, I'll ruin this entire episode. But I probably will ask Lindsay about sex robots. Uh, maybe there'll just be another sex toy, you know, and won't get super popular, but I doubt it. I think they're going to truly change life as we know it dramatically. Interesting to think about how much sex could uh, change in the coming years. If we thought porn was a big sexual norm disruptor, sex robots and virtual reality combined with enhanced artificial intelligence is going to change things that we won't be able to fully comprehend until they've happened. The future's coming, meet sex, and shit's going to get amazing and so fucking weird. Speaking of weird, now we're going to go to the edits of the internet, uh, but this one's different. Uh, it doesn't feel fair to call it idiots of the internet. It's more like the weirdos of the internet. I'm aware that maybe I am the real idiot uh, for thinking this stuff is weird also. Uh, I just couldn't stop looking at videos of pony play last night. And, and I, and I want to be clear again, I don't give a shit. That's what you're into. <laughs> but if you're into it, I, you got to understand it's pretty bizarre. Harmless, but bizarre. I don't think you're an idiot if you're into pony play. But what if you put on a pony play outfit and then you walk around out in public? Then I think you're a fucking weirdo. A harmless weirdo, but a weirdo. You're bizarre. If I see you in public dressed up in a sexy pony costume, now it feels like you're trying to force me to, to normalize your bizarre behavior. And I'm not ready for that yet. The definition of bizarre is odd, extravagant, or eccentric in style or mode. Pony play is all that. Uh, it's abnormal in the sense that you just don't see it very often. It's not practiced by many people. And, and, and the comments under this pony play video I'm going to um, talk about, holy fuck, they were killing me and I wanted to share my joy. Hoingy fucking boingy. Oofta. Oofta. All right, let's have some fun. TLC had a show called Addicted, <laughs> uh, My Strange Addiction. And, and uh, one of the episodes, it ran from 2010 to 2015. And one of the episodes was Addicted to Pony Play uh, in 2014. And the video, or the comments come from the video, a video taken of that episode. And I'm fasting. Nicole in the video claims to be addicted to dressing up and acting like a pony. And at the start of the video, she comes out of a barn in full pony play gear, like, like max pony play gear, and addresses her, her aunt, who has never seen her dressed up before. Never heard about this before. She, she tells her aunt this is who she is and she wants her, you know, aunt or aunt to accept her. Has her aunt, you know, help her put a few pieces of her pony costume on her. Like put her, put her bridle on her and stuff. And I gotta say, I, I am a pretty tolerant person, but this shit is too much for me. Her aunt gives her one of the greatest, what the fuck are you doing? Like, have you lost your goddamn mind looks ever? And I approve of that reaction. And here's why. You wanna be into pony play? Again, don't care. But why do you have to force that shit on your aunt? Right? That's what I don't get about this. You don't, you don't have to be that way all the time. That's a choice you're making and you're forcing your, your sexual you know, bedroom choices on everybody out in public around you. I love sexy dress up. I love garters and fishnets and crossless panties, but I'm not going to ask Lindsay to dress like that in front of my grandparents. Right? I'm not going to have her dress up. You know, if, not, not that she would, but I would never ask her in this situation. I would never ask her to dress up like a Catholic schoolgirl and then paddle her ass in front of Grandpa Ward and Grandma Betty you know, and the rest of the fam at, at the table during Thanksgiving dinner, you know, what, what happened to go get a room? I don't push my fetishes on anyone else. I don't push my sexual choices on anyone else. It's fucking private. 
You want to dress up like a sexual pony? Go for it. Enjoy it. But don't fucking push that shit on people in public and then get offended when it's not well received. You know, why can't you accept me? I can't you accept. I can. I just, I just can't accept this part of you in public. Part of me likes to jerk off. That's one of my private parts, right? That part, like dressing up like a sex pony, needs to stay in private. I don't get to not be insane and just beat off down at the park, you know, just stand there jerking and going, accept me. This is who I am. I'm a man who likes to beat his God given me. That's how I feel about most sex stuff. You want to do some anal fisting? Fucking go for it. But do it in the privacy of your own home, not on the sidewalk in front of the gas station, even though that would be a fucking awesome story to talk about later. Oh, and I just realized I didn't talk about anal fisting yet today. That's another type of kink. That one, whew, that, I'm gonna be, that one scares me. Uh, here's the definition of anal fisting real quick, and then we'll get back to pony play. This is from Kinkly, this kink devoted website. Anal fisting is a sexual practice in which one partner inserts a hand into the other's anus. Despite the term, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Despite the term's name, the hand is not actually in a fist position. Instead, the fingers are extended and overlapping. Right? This, this is a more advanced technique used in anal play. Anal fisting is sometimes referred to as handballing or fist fucking. Anal fisting re re requires experience, desire, communication, time, and most of all, lubrication. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. Desire, communication, time, and tons of lube. Oh my God. This, this all makes me picture a scene where the tone is almost that of like a rescue mission, you know, like where someone's injured, maybe trapped in a ravine or something, and the rescue workers are telling them that they're gonna, they're gonna save their life just to not give up. We're gonna get this done, okay? We're gonna get that hand in your ass, all right? All right, buddy, you're all right. It's not gonna be easy. You gotta keep talking to me. It's gonna take some time, but we're gonna get through this. We got a lot of lube. Uh, everybody's fingernails are trimmed. Are you ready? We're gonna get this done. We're gonna get that fist in your ass, okay? Let's, let's get started. You keep talking and don't you quit on me. Uh, Kinkley's definition of anal fisting continues with, this is definitely not something to be tried by people who are beginners anal sex. Uh, yeah. Uh, the risk of bleeding and rectal tears is high. That's fun. Uh, the, the receiving partner will definitely need to have an enema prior to getting started. And the giver should wear latex gloves to make the experience more pleasurable for their partner. The process of getting the entire hand in should involve a very long, gradual, sensual process. It starts with the tip of the finger. It involves a couple different sizes of butt plugs after quite some time. Most likely hours, it involves an entire hand. Don't be disappointed if the sphincter muscle refuses to cooperate. The first time, yeah, because fucking sphincter muscles aren't made for hands to be shoved in them. If this is a practice you and your partner want to master, just try and try again. What the fuck? <laughs> Why? This is too far. And it says, Fisty was made popular by gay and bisexual men in the late 60s and 70s at clubs and sex parties. Uh, one particular famous club was the Catacombs in San Francisco, opened in 75, hosted anal fisting parties. The club eventually grew to be a place for sadomasochism and welcomed lesbians, bisexuals, and heterosexuals. The club closed in 1984 after the rise in AIDS cases shown a spotlight on the risks of anal fisting. Wow, yeah, anal fisting in a sex club. A bunch of people just partying and having drinks and then occasionally shoving entire hands into someone else's ass. What, what could go wrong? Why didn't that work out? Uh, back to pony play now, which seems, I gotta say, more harmless than ever uh, and kind of vanilla after talking about anal fucking fisting. Um, check out how weird shit gets in the comment section. User Crispy Butterballs <laughs> writes, for a person who tends to pretend to be a wolf, I shouldn't be judging. Still, the tight bodysuit is a bit much. Oh, well. And then Michael Bauer replies, furry. Uh, a furry, by the way, is a type of kink or fetish related to pony play. A person with a furry fetish enjoys dressing up as animals, uh, being with others who dress up as animals, or being with stuffed animals. It can, but doesn't have to include an attraction to stuffed animals. It's not bestiality. Mostly dressing up in sexy animal or animal-ish costumes, more role play, uh, sometimes combined with BDSM. Then someone with the username of Diamus Serum leaves a pro puppy play, anti-pony play comment that was removed. Uh, puppy play is like pony play, but you're a puppy and not a pony. <laughs> puppy play uh, is it's like a role playing where like uh, you're a dog, you're down on all fours, you're barking and stuff. And, and like a pony person as a puppy, or like a pony person as a pony person trainer, a puppy person as a puppy person handler. There's also a lot of gear that can be involved. You, you can make your puppy uh, person need to have a doggy dish. You can put them in a kennel. Fucking whatever. It's just as fucking weird as pony play. <laughs> Another thing I don't care about in private, but I don't want to see in public. Look, I'll make you a deal. I promise not to jerk off on the lawn if you promise not to take your man dog for a walk in front of my house. And if you think I'm overreacting, I don't even fucking understand you. Like, maybe you're more sexually evolved than I am. 
right? You might be able to go to someone's house and pet their human dog, you know, and watch them send their human dog out to the kennel, you know, and then maybe they sit down dressed in a full latex gimp type suit. And the two of you just talk about politics and shit and sip Ar Arnold Palmer's and no one judges, no one laughs. Good for you. I can't fucking do it. If I walked into someone's house and they had a dude in a latex dog suit sleeping on like a giant doggy bed in some corner of the living room, I would for sure say something along the lines of, well, what the fuck is that guy doing? What's fucking dog guy up to? Uh, anyway, user Cough Pillbox doesn't like user Diamond Serum leaving a pro puppy anti-pony play comment and posts, it's just hilarious how you draw the line at pony play, but you brush off puppy play is fun and relaxing. Huh, <laughs> LOL. They're both just fetishes, my dude. And then Alexander replies to the initial comment about being a wolf furry, writing, your wolf isn't a furry. It's other kin. Jesus Christ. Look at this fucking, this is the most ridiculous argument ever. What's an other kin? Uh, I had forgotten, then I looked it up, and then I wished I didn't remember. It's more ridiculous than pony play or puppy play. Other kin are people who identify as partially or entirely being non-human. Dragon, lion, fox, whatever, you name it. Looking that up sent me into a late night other kin wormhole in, in, in a Vice article. Uh, I found this 19-year-old named John. He's being interviewed, and he says, I'm a red fox kin who was, as we call, awakened about a year ago. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. you're, you're a red fox kin. Okay. Then I'm a T-Rex slash dragon slash Blanca from Street Fighter 2 fucking hybrid. Basically, other kin are furries or puppy players or pony players who have taken the leap from sexual fetish to actual identity. Not just a sexual thing for them anymore. Uh, some of them feel like they, they are a pony <laughs> or, a, or a puppy or a fox trapped in a human body. And you know what? Get the fuck out of here. This is madness. This is madness now. You're not a fox or a wolf. You can pretend to be one. You're not a fucking German shepherd trapped in a human body. Go to a counselor now. Lower mammals don't have brains remotely equal to that of a human. We know that. Dog brains, for example, have been studied extensively. Fox brains have been studied. They're not as developed as our brains. If you were a fucking fox, you wouldn't be able to tell anyone that you were a fox because you would be super fucking dumb and you wouldn't be able to talk because foxes can't talk. You'd be shitting in the woods, not wearing clothing, killing small woodland creatures with your fangs and claws that you don't have because you're not a fucking fox, you fucking lunatic. Okay. If you want to get angry about that, then gee, whatever. I can't, I, my tolerance has limits. It, uh, otherwise, it's just fucking anarchy. And I'm just like, oh, today I'm a worm. Hey, you got to refer to me as a worm because that's how I identify now. Next day, I'm a cheetah. Stop calling me a worm. I'm a cheetah now. That's, I, I awakened. I'm a cheetah now. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, Taylor kills me with the following comment, writing, one day the horse girl in my school came in with a broken angle, so we put her down. I love it. Grand Shock Trooper also kills me, simply posting after watching this ridiculous video, God is dead and we killed him. <laughs> User Chi posts, hey, hey, if she trains hard enough, one day she could compete in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah! Get that pony person out there on the track! Come on! Uh, user dead inside posts, mom, honey, are you off your meds again? This lady puts horse bit into mouth. Huh? No. <laughs> Finally, user Carolyn Austin posts, I should really stop watching these and get a life. And I should too. I should stop talking about pony play. What am I fucking doing? I lost a good two hours of sleep last night watching pony play videos. So maybe I am truly the idiot of the internet, but I had a lot of laughs. So you know what? Thanks for that pony people. Now I got to get out of here. Uh, so I can actually go interview Sarsaparilla Spunkmeister. Yeah, yeah. Idiots of the internet. 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 All right, I hope that was as interesting for you as it was for me. <laughs> and again, if you're a pony player, I hope you're not galloping around all sad and butthurt now. You know, why can't you take this seriously? That kind of way. You know, don't let my negativity uh, put a frown in your bride or whatever. And if you're an other kin, I, yeah, it's too much. Too much. I can't go there. I cannot say like, ah, it's fucking cool. Whatever, man. Be a fox. Uh-uh. Nope. Uh-uh. Too much. It's that's now we've just delved into just gibberish. Why even have laws? Why even have society? Let's just all go fucking the streets and just just pretend we're whatever we want to be. Uh, okay, now let's check in now and see what my wife Lindsay has to say about sex. Get a female perspective. It feels fair. This could, this could get interesting.
All right. Well, thank you for joining me on Time Suck, Lindsay. Yeah. I mean, it's been a while, right? Mm-hmm. I can't even think it of the is. last thing that I popped in for. Drunk Suck, I think. Uh, on regular Time Suck. Secret Suck, I think you popped in, but not on oh, Time yeah. Suck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's been a long time. A lot mm-hmm. of requests. So glad Yay. I could help out. Yeah, this is a perfect uh, episode for it. And if you're watching, yes, we are in the Scared to Death Studios for this part because it's uh, built for two people, not for one. And but, if you're, but if you're did, listening, different little audio. Yeah, and, and we did bring some sex toys over, like some clean wean soap, some uh, <laughs> some, some, some chicken joe condoms. Some chicken joe bok bok play, Yeah, boy. we just, you know, these things won't be here for scared to death. Can, uh, I, call, can I call you South Barilla? Spunk, Spunkmeister now? I mean, when you were telling me that last night, I was dying. It was <laughs> now, so funny. So I, I guess the first thing, we'll get into like some real stuff here in a second. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, part of me, it's like... The, the other kin was where I reached my limit. That's where I'm like, okay, I can't. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, like, like, like if someone wants to do that, okay. But if like, if someone was my friend and it's like, hey, you got to refer to me as a fox now. I'm like, no, I don't. I, I don't I, think I, will I could. Not. I won't. But it's so, okay. So we were kind of like talking about this a little bit in between, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Where I, I'm, I'm so okay with whatever anybody wants to yeah. do. If you're bi, straight, trans, what, like right. all of those things, even though I don't necessarily always understand them, sure. I respect them. Yeah. I also don't go around pushing, uh, okay, this is a great example. You know that I'm like super into my crystals. I don't <laughs> actually push it on you, right? True. We talk you, about you it on the show. Don't. Yeah, homie, don't push it on me. I was saging the house this morning. I didn't mm-hmm. even acknowledge it to you. I didn't say like, yeah. okay, now you have to participate. Right. So to me, it's that same. We have, we have our own private things. Right. And it's that same place in your brain where it's like, uh, I don't, my dad is super religious. He doesn't push it on me. Right. I don't push my non-religion yeah. on him. So to me, it's all the same where it's like, yeah. I'm not going to fucking call you worm, fox. Yeah. Just, you're just Bob. You're and, just and, my friend. Yep. And and mm-hmm. I don't care that you do that. Yeah. But I don't push it on you. You don't push it on me. Just be respectful. Right. I think, and I think that's kind of where my head went with the pony play stuff initially where like, it, if I ask somebody about, you know, what their sex, you know, hey, I don't even know how that would come up. Like, hey, what are you doing? It just does, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it just does. But but honestly, not much for me. You know, I was just thinking like, you know, uh, I've worked with Joe longer than I've worked, you know, Joe Pazier. I've never asked him once like, hey, dude, what are you guys? Hey, what what are you guys into? (laughs) What are you and your wife doing at home? Well, I was actually. No, I don't. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Like my best friend. Mm -hmm. I have been best friends with her since she's in her mid thirties almost. Right. We've been best friends for like 15 years. And you're not like exactly like, what are you doing? There? No, it's it, like when she started dating her husband as when yeah. I started dating you, there is the conversation of like, so mm-hmm. how was the sex? Mm-hmm. There's always that conversation, but we're not sharing particulars. Now, if something happens and you're like, you're never going to believe what happened sure, last night. Sure, sure. Okay. And, and I know that like when us, because I know like when we first, you know, got naked around each other, like I remember you said that you told your friends, you thought it was a little weird that I threw my dick over my shoulder. When we were done, and you're like, that was weird. He's yeah, I, just, I couldn't over, believe it. Over, over on his back. You I was know? like, I was like, it, the last guy didn't do it like that. So I was <laughs> confused. Like, why does Dan have to do that? The other guy just let it drag on the floor. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> well played. I've but lived yeah. with you long enough. I know. I know yeah. where that was going. So, okay. Yeah. But but kind of moving away from pony play, I guess, like the extreme. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Because you're not a prude. What are your thoughts about Fuck kink? no, I'm not a prude. <laughs> what are your thoughts about kink in general? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just think, Fuck yeah. Like, you have at it. You know, mm-hmm. do do what you want to do. I was thinking about these questions, right? Because we were talking about it. And I realized that, like, in my early years of... So I lost my virginity when I was 16, almost 17. Mm-hmm. And that the first exposure to actual sex was pretty boring. And, and I had lived with my mom. My parents are divorced. Yeah. And my mom was very open in the sense that, like... She knew I was going to have sex for the first time. She said, oh, yeah. like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, let me get you on birth control. Of course, I was young and dumb and was like, I'm not waiting. You know, very typical. Yeah. Um, but my prior to having sex for the first time, I started Jeez. masturbating at a young age. Like, I okay. was very in tune with my body. Yeah. And I always enjoyed sex. But when it came to kink, so boyfriend one, or yeah. like first sexual partner, I should say. Okay. Very basic vanilla sex yeah, nothing yeah. nothing that i can remember out of the ordinary right it wasn't until a couple boyfriends or partners later yeah. that i like got my ass smacked for the first time and i was right. with that person for a significant period of my life so i just thought like oh this is just how sex is i didn't know okay. it was kink oh i, I see yeah. i didn't know it was weird mm-hmm. to want that yeah so i think i got really lucky because 
I was like, oh, this is just how sex is. Oh, yeah. we have anal okay. play. Oh, we talk dirty. Oh, right. we like ass smack. Okay. And that, and that is a good argument for porn, I will say, when mm-hmm. it, like the, the argument to normalize it. Yeah. Because my experience was different. You know, well, I guess not, not, not entirely different. The very first person beyond vanilla, like – a lot of, I, f- I mean, a, bad, a lot. Of, I found out after a lot of bad things happened to them. Yeah. So there was a lot of like abuse and th- that I didn't Ugh, know about until after that, and right. then, and then it was just like, and then so it, it gave me a horrible first impression mm-hmm. of sex, where it just gave me guilt yeah. and shame, and then and then the next person was much more liberated, no kind of hangers from before, and then I was just yeah. like, oh. But, yes. but it took a long time, you know, where uh, I, I do like that argument for porn where it's like, okay, there's there's other stuff out there. Yeah. I'm not the only one who's interested in this. It's not mm-hmm. weird for me to like this. Yeah. 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 And, and then as my experiences changed mm-hmm. and the people I dated or mm-hmm. slept with, because I'm very like, and, and I know we're going to get into that, but yeah. just because you've had sex with somebody doesn't mean you're in a relationship with them. Sure, right? sure, sure. So, so different partners brought different experiences to my yeah. life. Yeah. And... Yeah, I remember being in my early 20s and I was very casually seeing this mm-hmm. person and it was the first time somebody choked me mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, what was that? And then I was like, okay. <laughs> right, but like, right, I, right. I, again, no one was stigmatizing it to yeah. me. So I never... That's good. I, I don't know that I've ever been with someone who was like, well, that's fucking weird. And so I got lucky. Yeah. I think I got very lucky that I... Kink was never shamed to me. Slut okay. shaming, okay. different story. And I, yeah. we're going to kind of get into that a little bit later. Yeah. And for me, like early on, you know, like one longer term partner was very yes. judgy and was very, very vanilla. And that did mess my head up for a while. For it, sure. And something and, that we still talk about. Right. Exactly. Where I thought like anything, asking for anything out of just, you know, missionary, basic, very mm-hmm. basic stuff, we just like, oh, I'm just a filthy, you know, beast. Yeah. And how dare I? And, and when you talk about like talking to your yeah. friends about things, actually, that was something that. Early on, I was, wasn't that I was concerned, but I just remember right. saying to a girlfriend, like, can you believe that his yeah. partner said this to him and okay. and repetitively said that to him and made him feel this way? Because right. then I thought like, oh God, am I fucking weird? Oh, interesting. You yeah. know, we're yeah, like, yeah. oh, if another female is telling my partner who they were with that like that wasn't okay, like, oh my God, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe right. it's not okay. I think that was the only time. And then my girlfriends were like, don't be fucking crazy. That bitch is nuts. Okay. Like, okay. You know, yeah, yeah. but it's, but it's, I think all in all, and I, I know we're kind of getting off our little track. Oh, here, no, it's fine. Yeah. But I think all in all, it's, it's your experience. So right. if the person that you were with truly felt that, that wanting other things other than very basic mm-hmm. missionary position is wrong, they are entitled to that. And then yes, they yes, should yes. be with someone who also right. feels that way so that no one is left feeling insecure, yep. uh, gross, yep. uh, mentally not okay, like whatever, yeah. you know, it's like, you should just be with someone who matches you. Which to me is a big argument for premarital sex. Like, like, and the rates have Huge. gone up where almost everybody has it now, but it is this thing where it's like, you know, you do, if it's going to be an important part of your life, your sexuality, yeah. it's important that you find somebody that you match with. Right. You know, because otherwise it's not fair to either person. Correct. It's not fair to the vanilla person if they just want missionary. That's what they truly want. Yeah. And then the other person is walking in with spurs and a cowboy hat being like, and then they're sad that nobody wants to wear the saddle. I know that you're referencing pony play. I know. I'm trying to stop. But in my mind, I'm watching this show, A Million Little Things That You'll Never Watch. But this character, there's like a... Like a cowboy fetish? No, not even. Like he's dating a new person and like, she's like, why do you have cowboy boots? He's like, I thought they were cool. And I just was picturing, right. if you watch that show, I'm just picturing Gary right now. Like, oh, oh my okay. God, this is hilarious. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's let's move to okay. the, the next kind of topic. Let's really get in there. Oh, yeah, sexual fantasies. I wanted Hell to ask yeah. you about that because I whoop, talked whoop. a lot about that. You know, what people fantasize about. Yeah. What is your favorite sexual fantasy? Well, I, I'm going to go ahead and let you answer first. Oh, that's right, because, because it's kind of the same. Basically the same thing. I know, and it's funny. That, yeah, we talked about this this morning. I was going over these questions with you. Mine, yeah. mine is a combo of BDSM, role play, and anal. Uh, yep, sounds you, right. You tied up, dressed up, and, and I get to do what I want with you. Yeah. And you were, yeah. And I what know, did I, I say? What did I say? You're like, that's what I've been like basically talking about, but I'm not comfortable and, and wasn't comfortable yeah. always very, very hit and miss. Mm-hmm. And I think it was because of the Freudian stuff I talked about earlier in yeah. this episode where that was in my head from early psychology class days mm-hmm. of thinking that this stuff was from trauma or like the kink was right. from like a damaged place. 
And I was so glad I read so many studies this yeah. week that just burned that out of my brain. It's like, wow, what a waste of time. Well, which, yeah. which makes me why I'm glad we're doing this episode too. Totally. I'm you know? thrilled. <laughs> but And just for people listening as well. Yes, but yes, yes, also for us. Well, and I think also too, like, I mean, and I don't want to take on like a sad note. We don't need to go down yeah, this yeah, rabbit yeah. hole. But like I was raped. Mm-hmm. So I think that then for some people. Yeah partners, what, yeah. whatever your orientation is, if you know that your partner has been sexually assaulted in any capacity, right. wh- whatever that is, you know, yeah. a family member, a stranger, whatever, something has happened to them, if they're asking you to kind of recreate, because what mm-hmm, I like, mm-hmm. so we're going to talk about fantasies, uh, and when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, yeah. I think that it opened the conversation up. I'm not okay. I'm not going to be an advocate for like, oh, it was the best book ever. Right, I read right. it yeah. and was like, oh, okay. Yeah. But to me, it was like, oh, yeah, I always wanted those things. Like, yes, please, tie me up. Okay. Make me beg for it. Okay. Like, like yeah. the suspension, it's almost like a, f- um, a drawn-out foreplay. Yeah. Okay. Right? Like, just like you want it to, like, go and go and go. Although mm-hmm. I will say, like, <laughs> I remember one night, not together all that long ago, that we were like, yeah, we're going to do this whole long thing. And I then know. five minutes in, we were both like, all right, that was good. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, let's just have sex now and be and finish. Not, not that it lasts. No, yeah. But, like, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know I'm mean. not a porn star and you're not a porn star. And right. like, I mean, I can only handle so much stimulation. Yeah. and You know? So it, it's like, mm-hmm. Jesus. But, but so anyways, to go back to what I was saying, any, I like... The tie me up. I like right. all of that. I like um, very, it feels very actually typical. Very feels very like, okay, basic white bitch. Like, I just want you to be the man and take control. Okay. Like, yeah. I yeah. love that. You know that. But you also know what has happened to me. And I so know. I can only imagine how that must play out in your head to a certain level of like, is she somehow processing like a trauma? Is this mm-hmm. okay? Is this safe? Should we be in? Should she be in therapy? Like, is she all right? Like, I can see that. Yeah, early on, those were thoughts. Of you course. know, it's like, and then I want to add to it and things. But totally. now, now I get. It. I am so glad I did this because now I think I'm over that. Great. Where now I'm just like, oh, okay. It's gonna be a fun weekend. <laughs> no kids in the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm so I'm so glad I got you know got to get uh, my head around kind of this information a lot yeah. more. And, and also, one thing I learned this week. To steer it in a different way, just reminds me of the conversation we had this morning. Mm-hmm. And we talked about like the setup it takes to do these kind of fantasies oh gosh, where, you know, yeah. sometimes you don't have the time. And then that would get in my head because we're so busy. I've been so busy with work. I mean, specifically mm-hmm. the podcast did increase my <laughs> workload exponentially. Yes. And so it definitely affected our sex life tremendously. Absolutely. Our entire life. Our, our entire life. And then with the kids and everything else. And then I would get really worried like, oh, my God, we're not having sex as much as we mm-hmm. used to. And it's just all going to go away forever. I did like uh, in this, you know, studies I was reading that just talked about happiness overall. Yeah. And there was no uh, correlation between unhappiness Mm -hmm. in a relationship overall Mm -hmm. with a lack of sex. We're basically like, yeah, we'll have a, we'll have periods where yep. we won't have it as much. We'll have periods when we have it more. Yeah, but it's not the end all be all of a relationship, which is also important to point out on a sex related episode. Yeah, that as important as sex is, it doesn't need to be your your everything. Well, and we've had, yeah. you know, we're not a couple that fights a lot, but no. I, we have had some very intense conversations around exactly yes. that. Yes. About like you being worried, like, well, are mm-hmm. we always going to be this tired? And if I'm working this mm-hmm. hard and just at the end of it, our relationship's just going right. to crumble, which is a valid concern, but it was generally around the sex aspect. True. And True. as a woman, and I think it's important to say, because I think that we have a lot of male listeners, yeah. not that we don't have female, yeah. but I think that it's important to point out Something that comes up with me and my girlfriends continually is I'm tired. Whether I've got a a job outside of the home or not, I think that women continually feel, right? okay, I not only have my job, but then I have the job of running the household. And I relate to that very much so, where it's like, we joke, I'm the home boss, but I am. But I also help run a fucking company. True, true, true. And we have a particular situation with kids where it's like, I'm fucking driving back and forth. Oh, yeah. So... It's often the last thing that's on my mind. It doesn't mean that when I look at you, I'm not attracted. It doesn't mean that I don't occasionally masturbate. It doesn't mean that I'm not thinking about sex. It means that like when you're telling me you want to have sex or you're like, you know, I tease you. I'm like, okay, yep, you're making the look at me. I see (laughs) it coming. All I'm thinking about is like, but I have to get to the grocery store. I have to meal right. prep. There, There's an art project that has to be done. There's yep. clothes in the laundry. We've been doing saddle training for four hours. I yeah. had to take the spurs to you again. You know, and my and back like, is all... Your back is her. Sarsaparilla! She's tired, you know? Yeah, she's she is tired. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so I think it's really important to point out that I don't... If you're in a relationship, yeah. a long-term relationship... 
there are going to be phases of I'm too tired. Like, yes. like when you're early on in your dating and you're fucking all the time, <laughs> right. you have to be realistic that that is not how it's going to be. And what I find is that men, sorry, generally think that, that is how it's going to be. They're like, fuck yeah, I found this girl who loves to suck my dick. She loves to have sex all the time. She's always in lingerie. And I'm referencing our beginnings. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like we were doing all the things all mm-hmm. the time. Uh, we were living in a bubble. Yes, yes. And it's not, yeah, exactly. You know, so it's just, and it's not to say that we don't do those things. It's just yes. harder to find the time in and, moments. And, and it depends and, on your life too. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it depends on choices you make. You know, we chose to start a business, yep. which is going to take more time than a day job. Mm-hmm. You know, that you can leave at work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's kids that were mm-hmm. brought up. So it's like, that's something that, you know, obviously we knew about because they were there from the beginning with us. There's dogs. There's dogs. The dogs are <laughs> such ah, cock they're the blockers. the biggest cock blockers ever. I know. Penny and Gigi are the biggest cock blockers Literally ever. ever. We have to, yeah, we have to kick them out of the room. That was the thing crank we up learned. Crank the music. Crank up the music. Give to, them a special To bow. drown out their fucking constant <laughs> cries and their scratching on the door and then deal with the weirdness after sex when we if open were, the like, door. Covering up private cover my parts. Dick, and the dogs stare at me like I've just fucking beaten you for <laughs> 10 minutes. They're worried. They look They're, concerned. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, porn, if you want to move on to porn, because porn talked about that a lot in this episode. Yeah. What are your thoughts on porn? Well, I personally like porn. Mm -hmm. Uh, And why do you like porn? Well, I have used it as like a preemptive sort of like, like how long can we watch it without reenacting it? Like it's a good, I think it shows different ways to do things. Okay. You know, it can just, Mm -hmm. listen, we all fall into like, this is what we do. I do this and then you do that and then the, 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 the. And listening to you talk about this, it's like, yeah, porn is great because it shows you change. It shows you something different. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Now, brain responds to that. Yeah. And I didn't even know that that was what I was doing. Yeah. Me either. That was cool to learn. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it can be empowering, Mm -hmm. you know, where it's like, oh, I have that fantasy. Oh, look at all these other people also have this fantasy because right. you can see like downloads or views. Right. Okay, so okay. It, it normalizes yeah. it a little bit. Yeah, it makes me about feel that. less uncomfortable. And I just, I mean, sometimes it's hilarious. What do you watch? Hmm, it depends. You like the rougher stuff, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, I might get uh, around to understanding a little bit of that better now because see, kind of what we talked about earlier with the Freudian background, mm-hmm. I've never liked that stuff because- you like pictures. Uh, yeah, I've like still pictures, mm-hmm. and, just, and I've never liked. But also with the videos, if I feel like the guy, if I, if the guy comes across as being a jerk to me, I'm just like, why are you being a dick? <laughs> I mean, I would say like the most. But I didn't understand like a fantasy. Like I was looking yeah, at like, yeah. oh man, it's this poor thing. No, but I mean, she agreed to it, and I think that that's why. Yeah. With all of this, I just feel like if you have consenting adults, whether it's two or ten, <laughs> right, right, then fine. No, I'm not going to watch. I like a little bit of a storyline. Okay. But I never like to listen to it. Their voices are always weird. They're not, they're not the greatest actors a lot of times, too. No. They're not, no. They're not picked because of all the acting school they went that's to. That's right. That's right. This is no Brad Pitt, Angelina, Jolie <laughs> kind of thing. It's not a lot of emotional nuance no. in a lot of the scenes. No, no. So it's like, you know, and then I have like my own weird things where I'm like, I don't want to watch like a, a supposed incest thing. Which is super popular now, like and, and off the charts. I'm not judging. And also like, I'm realistic that, hello, this is porn. They're probably not actually... Oh God, no. Stepmom and no. step you know what I mean? So no. it's like I realize that it's no, just not. something yeah. they're acting out. Yeah. But that being a stepmom, that's oh, like yeah. it's too close that's to home. Creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. Yeah. But 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 you know, like whatever. But yeah, like a lot of like tying up. I would look pretty much the okay. BDSM. Okay. And I mean we talked about this a little bit last night. I don't have a problem watching like a gangbang. Because right. in my mind, they're consenting adults. I don't want to watch a, a biopic of someone who was gang raped. That doesn't fucking turn oh, me on. Those are two yes. very different got things. You, and I think you. it's important yeah. to say that because you can take, I think that someone can watch a gangbang porno yeah. and then kind of like what you're talking about, like you go to that Freudian place if you're like, huh, huh, this is not okay. Why right. are they doing that to her? Right, right. It's very different to watch a porno that people consent to do than to yeah. see it as part of a real life thing. Okay. Yeah. No, that, okay. I love that. I love like, that perspective. Um, another thing that comes up a lot in porn, uh, the dudes talk about a lot for sure. Mm-hmm. Anal. Anal. Why is there a fixation with anal sex? Well, listening to you research this, do you think yeah. that it is because it's something new? Oh yeah. I, I guess they're pro- probably like cyclical mm-hmm. where it's like, it wasn't nearly as popular, at least in studies and stuff back in like the forties, fifties things. Ah, where people were probably virgins. So she was new anyways. Oh, right. Right. So there's more novelty. 
Uh, yeah, prop that is, that actually does make sense. Where yeah. like you're, we're we're more desensitized because we see so much sex on, mm-hmm. and then now understanding. I didn't think about that until you said that. Yeah, where if our brains are just not kicking out the dopamine mm-hmm. uh, towards regular sexual stimuli, mm-hmm. you know, then we're going to probably want to take things further. That's the next, I guess, step that makes yeah. sense that way. Because yeah. it is a different thing where it's like you know. Like, uh, our parents did not grow up when they were watching TV, watching everybody allude to fucking all the time. Like, like I do think right. about, and I referenced it a few times, but leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best. It, it was just a type of sitcom. Right. I mean, they slept in separate beds. It showed them getting this, like the I Love Lucy, all that kind of stuff. There was no references to real sexuality. So yeah. that's all you're seeing. Then any kind of sex is going to be like, whoa, yeah. this is off the charts. Right. And, and the people that you were it, yeah. sleeping with were generally virgins. I think that oh, there is a yeah. virginal well, element to anal. Oh, oh okay. okay. So hear ah, me out. Okay. So I feel like mo- more, yeah. there was less premarital sex in previous yes. generations, yes. right? That's true. Yeah. Fact. Mm-hmm. Fact? Fa- yes, fact. Okay. Less so, partners on average. Right. So if you're not having premarital sex mm-hmm. and, you're, and, and your partner is also not, mm-hmm. you are conquering that for the first time no one else okay, has. Now, okay. anal sex, maybe your partner wasn't into it before, but now you've been in a long-term relationship. Right. You're willing to explore that because you're in a place yeah. of safety and trust and all those open communication, all those things. Right. So now you're willing to explore this new boundary. Right. right. So, so, okay, so let's just take it back. So you and yeah. I had previous partners. I mean, yeah. obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. like not only right, married and right, had children, right, right, but right. like we were in our th- I, 30s, whatever. Yeah. Okay. We were not like religiously devout. Like we mm-hmm. were having sex. Yeah. Okay. With other people prior. Yeah. Now let's just say I had come to the table and said I'd never had anal. Would right. that make anal that much more interesting to you? Because you're like, oh, okay, no one else did this. I'm sure, gonna do it. Sure. That like is, I'm gonna. That is a guy thing. Yep. I whatever. Mean, there is some stuff I didn't include it in the episode because there was just so many rabbit holes I could go down. Sure. And I started to go down one. And I could tell I didn't have time to finish it. Yeah. But there was this like you know like uh, sexual beginnings for for kind of humans. Mm-hmm. And there was this thing back in the days of like the Babylonian and the early Mesopotamian societies where basically how did people increase their power? Uh, relationships. Relationships meant everything to get yeah. land and to get power. And and relationships were built through marriage. Mm-hmm. And basically that's when kind of women became like property, mm-hmm. where it was to solidify bonds for the men and it be and it was this biological thing where you know uh, a, a, a man could seed many women and increase his empire right. because that's still his blood his blood lineage increase his family have that family blood connection yeah they can then all go get more connections and get more powerful mm-hmm. and a woman biologically can't do the same thing correct so it became more important for women to be virginal so the man mm-hmm. with her knew this is my offspring mm-hmm. not Larry's Got it. And it's furthering my connection. And so if you take that further and that's ingrained in our heads, there could be something where maybe that's why guys have that virginal attraction. Mm-hmm. It goes back to all those day, you know, you know, years, so many years ago. Yeah. When it ties into something instinctual, we're trying to further our lineage. Yeah. We're trying to, it's our domain, increase our, yeah. you know, empire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. So, I mean, and, you know, I think with everything, if it's consenting adults, yeah. have at it. You right. know, but like overall, I just think like, uh, you know, like just go slow, yes. be careful. And with anal sex in particular, just fucking be patient, you guys. Yes. I was talking to a girlfriend this morning and she said the funniest thing to me. Yeah. I was, oh my God, I was dying. I don't want to out her, but by saying her name, but she was like, oh yeah, anal sex. My partner and I have done that a few times. Yeah. And it, the whole next day, it's just fucking shit and jello. Oh my God. And I was like, oh my God, that's what you guys don't realize too. Like, I didn't even think about that. It's not just all the lube and the this mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. the that. And like, you know, there are like lubes that you can literally like syringe, use a syringe right, to insert right. for numbing and stretching. Yep. And uh, and then you come in our ass <laughs> right. and then we go to the bathroom, which we always do after we have sex. So we don't yeah. get a UTI. Like you guys don't have yeah, any yeah, of these fucking concerns yeah. where it's like, one day after sex, I'll wake up and I'm like, fuck, my ovary hurts. God damn it. Get the cranberry juice. Like, right. I have to like work so hard to keep my vagina happy after right. we have sex. Yeah. Now you're going to include my ass. Yeah. And so now it's like, I mean, the diarrhea the next day, I oh hate to be God. so graphic and gross, yeah. but here we go. Yeah. It's like, I am letting go of urine and your cum that is like lodged <laughs> up in there and diarrhea. Oh my God. And your butt is sore. Think yeah. about like when you've had the stomach flu mm-hmm. and it like starts to hurt to go to the bathroom. That is what it's like for uh, 24 hours after anal sex. Wow. Even even though it's enjoyable. Right. Right. Like right. the moment is like so good and yeah. you love it. Yeah. But then the next day you're yeah. like, God damn it. 
Okay. Kind of feel like you might want to wear a diaper. Okay. That'll make, I, I'm, I'm going to, I have some at the end of today's episode, I found a great article for advice about it that goes into some yeah. pretty funny things that I think you'll like. Okay. There's just one thing that talks about going slow that I'm, now I'm killing my joke for later, but it is <laughs> just okay. like, it said, don't Kool-Aid your way in. <laughs> And not everyone will get that reference, but it's the old commercial where the <laughs> where the Kool Aid Man would barge through the wall. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, he smashes through the wall. Yeah, don't smash in. Don't, don't smash, smash in. in. Don't smash in. It don't, can be oh, done. Yeah. Just be patient, and you have to do it. Kind of going back to what you said before about yeah. like set up for fantasies. Yeah, anal sex. You have to be committed to like okay, once a week we're really gonna work on that butthole. Right, right, right. Yeah, because it's a it's muscle. A lot of it goes back. Things. Yes, yes. Right, but I mean. Get a butt plug. Get a few. Get different sizes. <laughs> now, we, now we have in our recording schedule time today before everybody has to go home. We have time for one or two more questions. I want to make sure yeah. that you address oh, I what you want to like address. A demo. <laughs> no, I want to get cause, nervous. No, because I know you prep some stuff. So well, how about you steer us out, out of here with the things you want to talk about at the end? Well, just the the you know some some things that I think are really important. Yeah, it was it was your question to me about like what sexual advice. Yes. Would you give to young women? And yes. I I think that that's a really great place to end this segment. Okay. Because I think it's really important, whether it's like young women, old women, whatever, wherever you're at in your sexual journey, yeah. people always like reference our relationship and will ask me, you know, like, oh, how, co- how come your relationship's so good? And I think the thing to know is communication. Mm-hmm. And you and I talk about this a lot. I mean, Dan and I talk about everything, True. literally everything. True. And I don't know if that's a result of you having a marriage that fell apart um if you just learned because i don't mm-hmm. know that everyone Part of it. yeah mm-hmm. but we talk about everything and when it comes to sex you have to talk about everything yeah. yeah every step of the way every like you should be in such a comfortable place with your partner yeah. that talking about sex is like talking about balancing the checkbook nothing's off limits that's a great analogy yeah right because if you financially cheated on me, yeah. I would actually be more angry than if you physically cheated yeah, on me. We've talked about right? that. Right. So yeah, there's yeah. I think a correlation mm-hmm. there where I wouldn't go out and buy um a new car without talking to you about it first. It's a huge commitment. You can't just shove your dick in my ass without talking to me about it. It's a right. huge commitment. <laughs> right. Okay. Right? Like yeah. it's and so wherever you're at in Wink. Your, yeah, no, okay, but yeah. Are we yeah. buying a new car? No, I thought oh. I, was, I was I was playing up on the huge, but okay. I know I know. Oh just, shoot, yeah. I thought hey. we were getting uh. like a new car. Dang it! Um, <laughs> but I just think it's really important to know that that like, and also not to be ashamed if you're mm. with somebody who you share with them your fantasy and they laugh at you or they mock you. Oh yeah, that's then it's not a healthy relationship, right? You gotta go. You gotta go. They can have a weird reaction. There, there's nuance within that. Yeah. If I told you that I wanted to do, to do pony play and you just kind of laughed at me. <laughs> That's but, literally where my head went. With I, know. I, I I was picturing me the music like all by myself. And then you just walking away in like a complete pony outfit and just like <laughs> so sad. But then I would hope that the next day you'd be able to come back to me and say, I'm sorry I didn't handle that appropriately. Yes. Are you being serious? And yes, this is something true, we have to true, talk true. about. And, and I would. And you yeah, have to have yeah. humor about all of it because if you're going to start experimenting with fantasies and butt play and yeah. all these different things and, you know, if you want to come all over my fucking face, like, there's going to... I mean, it's happened. Yeah. There's... I'll just keep it for the rest, for the rest of the episode. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you, there, there's discomfort. There's... Yeah. There's humor in all of it. And like you just have to humble yourself. Mm-hmm. And then also I just kind of want to say like, and if you want to sleep around, fucking have at it. Just be I, smart. Not not us. Oh, We're Jesus in a Christ. relationship. Like, what are you talking about? But like when oh, I yeah. when I was single of all my girlfriends, I was like, fuck it. You oh, we're at the bar and you want to sleep with him? Do it. Where are you going with him? Right. Be is, safe. You, is your find be safe. a friend tracker on? Yeah. Do you really know this guy? Maybe you should come to our apartment and have mm-hmm. sex. Like just yeah. think about what you're doing, especially as a woman, mm-hmm. you know, because not that men can't be raped. That's absolutely a thing mm-hmm. that happens. So male or female, just be aware of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Know where you are. Make sure somebody else knows where you're going, what you're up to. Yeah. Just just be yeah. smart but yep. but don't be ashamed of it like be, be smart don't be ashamed and talk that's like the big takeaway just communicate 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 communicate, communicate, communicate. Mm-hmm. and when you and your partner start fighting a lot mm-hmm. that was like one thing that i like made a little note you and i don't have a lot of time for sex right now because our life is the path that we have chosen sure, to sure. execute but i know that we both know like anytime we're starting to really snap at each other 99.9 mm-hmm. of the time one of us will say to the other one when's the last time we had sex true true that connection yeah. yep. Is, very important. is very important. It's not about the quantity of sex. It's about oftentimes just 
skin to skin, getting back to your basics. Yep, yep. Ah, uh, good stuff. I love sex. Ah, uh, I love you, Sarsaparilla. <laughs> I love you, sexy pony man. <laughs> I can't remember my pony name right I don't now. Know ah, okay. Thank you guys for listening to this interview with Lindsay, Queen Hi. of the Suck, and and scared to death, scared to death co-host, and all the things, all the things, all the things. Oh, that was so fun. That was so fun. Uh, glad I got, and I learned some things. There were some things in there that um, you know, the Lindsay and I just talked about. It's funny. Sometimes um, I think both of us almost feel more comfortable on camera. Maybe it's just more me. But that was like a, a more candid conversation and we're pretty open, you know, talk about a lot of things, but I learned some new things about her, learned some uh, good, healthy sexual perspective stuff. Hope you guys did as well. That was very, very cool. And now for sex tips, we'll, we'll end up with some sex tips before uh, we go into the top five takeaways. I promised them earlier and we were just talking about uh, uh, the anal stuff. I, f- I feel like a teenage girl because I I f- the best article I found for about anal sex came from Cosmopolitan, from Cosmo Magazine, um, anal sex tips. You know, and I just think with a lot more people bored and at home, I'm guessing a lot more people are going to be trying stuff for the first time. And this is one of the things that people uh, tend to try. Fairly popular. So here we go. How to have anal sex. Uh, step one, and this, this is the joke I already ruined. Treat anal like a door, literally. You got, you got to ring the doorbell before entering. And this is uh, Isharna Walsh, founder, creator of Coral, a sexual wellness app, is, who says this. She says, massage and warm up the anus before entering anything inside. And she's the one who said, be a good guest. So actually it wasn't my joke, everyone, it was hers. Be a good guest. Uh, don't just Kool-Aid man yourself to the door. That is so funny to me. You don't want to be, oh yeah, just trying to barge in. That's going to equal, oh, uh, fuck no. Uh, step two, uh, prepare a resting station. And that's a little spot for like the toys or lube that you're going to need. Because it is a process. So you're going to have like a, a towel out or something with all your stuff, your lube, your, 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 um, your butt plugs, all those things that are out there, um, any kind of vibrators and stuff. Step three, uh, never thought of this. Try a little sacral massage. Take 15, 20 minutes. Give the receiving partner a sacral massage. The, and that's the lower back just above the butt crack. The muscles and nerve endings in the sacrum extend to the whole pelvic girdle and can help release tension. Didn't know that. Step four, stimulate around the anal opening first. A lot of nerve endings in that area. Make friends with the whole area before you try and go inside. Uh, step five, don't neglect the clit. Having clitoral stimulation is super important during anal play because it helps a vulva owner to relax and then become fully aroused. Relaxes the whole erogenous zone. Maybe try a vibrator, some other favorite sex toy. Step six, try a heated lubricant. Didn't know about this. The heat created actually helps bring blood flow to the area, helps increase stimulation to the pleasure receptors in the rectum slash anus, explains Dr. Nickett San Paul uh, of Brookdale Hospital Medical Center. Step seven is to relax. Put on some music, put you in a calm mood, breathe. The more tense you are, uh, the harder it's going to be to enjoy. The muscles will get, you know, firmer. Step eight, use a water-based lubricant. Sexologist Jill McDevitt says to secure a quality water-based lube ahead of time. This will make rubbing and massaging that much better. Even if your foreplay doesn't uh, involve penetration for now, lubes make everything better and can increase sensitivity. Step nine is toys. McDevitt uh, recommends trying a vibrating anal toy with a broad head. Simply place the head against the anal opening, but don't insert or glide the toy in a circle around the opening. External anal vibrations add completely new sensations. Alternate between the vibe and your finger to really tease. Uh, Also start small with anything that does get inserted. Very small butt plug. Uh, Maybe a finger. Make sure that fingernail is not jagged. Don't overlook that. Uh, You know, get the fingernail file out beforehand. Step 10, more lube. Use as much as you need. Never skimp on the lube. Might feel odd, but it, uh, you know, it shouldn't hurt. And oftentimes it'll hurt if there's not enough lube. Uh, and step 11, just the tip. Start shallow. Don't get impatient. Everything that goes in should be just the tip. The nerve endings you're trying to stimulate are in the anus, hence the moniker rimming, not all the way up there, which is generally the painful part. And also the part that makes you feel like you need to take a huge dump. Uh, step 12, slow the fuck down. Don't ram away like you see in porn. What they don't show, and I've known people have worked in porn, is all the previous steps we just talked about. They don't show all the preparation. They don't show the getting ready. They just show jackhammering away. And that's not how uh, it works, you know, right off the bat, uh, unless you want to go to the ER for a rectal tear or worse. Uh, Step 13 doesn't have to be done doggy style. Find a position that works for you. There are a variety of positions like lying on your back with your hips elevated, sitting on the, uh, uh, you know, facing the guy, reverse cow, uh, there's also a reverse cowgirl. Um, Step 14, last step, communications key. And that's really with all of this. Communication is key. Just, just like with fisting, you know, which I kind of see still freaks me out. Uh, and important to note, not as dirty as you might think if poop is getting into your head, 
Clinical sexologist Kat Van Kirk points out that the anus and the lower part of the rectum have very little fecal matter, fecal material in them. Not as dirty as most people think. Uh, also, if you're doing uh, this stuff, make sure your partner doesn't put anything uh, in your vagina that was just in your butt before uh, washing it off because that could lead to an infection. And then that's it. That, after that, it's just good luck. Not everyone likes it. If your partner tries it and hates it, tries it and hates it again, you might have to just let it go. Maybe, maybe, maybe give Pony Play a try. Uh, okay. Two more sex tips. Let's do best uh, female orgasm uh, tips and then also best blowjob. Quick word on female orgasm feels fair after the butt stuff, which is sounds like mostly for dudes, not always. Uh, here's some good advice I found that I agree with. Uh, every vagina person, obviously a bit different, but most of the time it's good to make friends with the clit. This is some advice from sex therapist, Marianne Brandon, PhD. Start with the T's. Touch her everywhere but her clitoris, the sides, above it, below it, her labia, around her vaginal opening. Play with her pussy over her panties. Apply pressure to the sides of the clitoris, alternately, uh, alternately, alternately positioning the base of the V formed by your fingers above and below her clitoris. As you progress to more intense stimulation, target the upper left quadrant of her clitoris, highly sensitive area for most women, Brandon says. Know that there is a hood over her clitoris, she adds. You could pull that up, see how she responds for, uh, to more direct contact. Once you take her over the top, don't evacuate the area. She may be up for round two or sometimes three. Brandon says it's typically easier for women to have multiple orgasms if the contact doesn't dis discontinue completely. But she also says she's going to need a little break from the intensity. Uh, she suggests leaving your fingers where they are, but only applying the slightest pressure and no back and forth. Then slowly start moving again. See how she responds to that. If she jerks like it's too much, stay quiet a little longer. If she's responsive, you can get started again. And that was a, a tip actually from Men's Health uh, for the best orgasm ever. So I thought was pretty good. Last sex tip, uh, how to give an amazing blowjob. This is pretty uh, simple. Uh, you put it in your mouth and suck it. Uh, all right, let's get to today's top five. Uh, no. <laughs> JK, there's a, there's a bit more to it than that. Vanessa Marin, certified sex therapist in LA, says that men love blowjobs because the act feels like sex, but it's different because they get to relax and receive and just enjoy what's happening in front of them. She adds that the visual element of watching their penis slip in and out of a mouth gets a lot of guys going. I concur. Uh, Vanessa's first piece of advice is show enthusiasm, and I couldn't like that more, right? Holy shit, that is so true. Best blowjobs are the ones where you feel like the person giving it really wants to suck it. Right When they act like that dick, uh, just fucking save them from dying in a fire and they just want to express the most possible gratitude. Uh, Vanessa show, uh, says to show eye contact, tell him how turned on you are, you know, be verbal, ask him what he wants. Communication again, coming back to that, so much of uh, good sex is about communication. And then she gives some technique tips. Use those hands. She says if your jaw starts to feel sore or tired a few minutes into the job, you're likely suctioning too hard with your mouth. Shift some of the work to your hands, counting on them for pressure. And then she says, here's your basic stroke once you've warmed up a bit. Wrap your dominant hand around a shaft, add your, add your mouth, uh, connect your hand to your lips, as in press your index finger and thumb, you know, when you're making the, the O sign, against your lips, keep them sealed there, move your hand plus lips up and down on this penis. Uh, yes and yes and more yes. Uh, and then she says, try this wrist twist with your mouth on his penis, uh, rotate your firm wrist in a clockwise circle as you move your hand up and down. Uh, Big fan. She also says, don't be afraid to add spit, right? Spit on that dick. You know, rude to spit on someone's face. Fucking hot to spit on the dick. Uh, and Vanessa also says, when you're blowing him, your tongue provides warmth, texture, and wetness that he can't get elsewhere. Maximize its sensation. Keep your tongue soft in your mouth when you're moving up and down the majority of the blowjob. Then use the tip of your tongue to trace the head and frenulum, underside where the penis head meets the shaft. Those two areas, especially the frenulum, packed with nerve endings. So he'll go crazy. Uh, yes, again. And then she says, if you can handle it, try the deep throat. Obviously, sometimes gag reflexes prevent that. Uh, and then also some guys like a little butt play during the blowjob. She says, if he's into it, move a finger or two towards his uh, perineum or taint, the area between his scrotum and his anus. Go from there. The prostate lies right under the perineum and is known to be the male G-spot. The holy trifecta of oral sex is mouth on head, hand on shaft, hand on balls, says Marin. Uh, the holy quad would bring the butt into it. So there you go. Right? Sex stats, sex talk, sex tips. It was the sex suck. Uh, communication, communication, communication. That's what Louis Safina wants you to work on most when it comes to sex. The older I get, the more important I realize communication is so important in so many ways. Still realizing that. That includes sex. Your partner can't read your mind. 
You know, how, how, how are they going to uh, do what you want if you don't tell them? Also hygiene. Let me say that. Clean that fucking wing. Clean that lady wing. Get all that shit. Mama Ridgeway sparkling clean. Clean that butt. Clean that mouth. Just be clean. Good hygiene is so attractive. Bad hygiene is so unattractive. I try not to kink shame, but I will hygiene shame all day long. And I realize I've kink shame about pony play. But, but hygiene shame, oh my, it's so unnecessary. Don't reek of BO. Don't let your teeth wear sweaters. Don't let your belly button smell like someone took a shit in it. Don't let your butthole smell like the place that the shit came from. Scrub that swamp ass. We're all washing our hands a lot more now. Don't forget to wash that dick and wash those pussies. And, that, and that's it. Time now for top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, if you're going to try anal, statistically so common now, go slow, talk it out, use so much lube. Number two, kink. It's okay, right? Wanting to be, wanting to be spanked doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Neither does, uh, as much as I have joked, wanting to get a little butt plug tail and have your partner yell, giddy up, sarsaparilla spunkmeister, Captain Whiskerhorn's ready to ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number three, porn, good or bad, sounds like both. Watch too much and you may burn out the part of your brain that gets turned on. You may have your expectations so altered that real life sex seems boring and uninteresting, uninteresting. However, you might also learn some new tricks. You might also get turned on in ways that carry over to more fun in the bedroom. And it might make you realize, oh, okay, there's nothing wrong with me. Plenty of people like this. Might destigmatize stuff. Number four, the Coolidge effect. How cool was that to learn about? Our brains love new. And with sex, new doesn't have to be a new partner. It can be a new type of sex. It is female ejaculation. Fucking strap in. You don't need a penis to ejaculate. You just need a, a, a urethra. Your urethra is a tube that allows urine to pass out of the body. Ejaculation occurs when fluid, not necessarily urine, is expelled from your urethral opening during sexual arousal or orgasm. This is different from the cervical fluid that lubricates a vagina when the vagina owner is turned on or, quote, wet. Is female ejaculation common? Yeah, somewhat. In one sex study of 233 sexually active women, about 126 people, 54%, said that they experienced ejaculation at least once. About 33 people, 14%, said they experienced ejaculation with all or most orgasms. In a recent cross-sectional study of female ejaculation that followed women aged 18 to 39 from 2012 to 2016, researchers concluded that a whopping 69.23% of participants experienced ejaculation during orgasm. But is female ejaculation the same thing as squirting? No, sorry, but it is not. Research suggests female ejaculation and squirting, the kind seen in porn, are two different things. Squirting, that gushing fluid, often seen in adult films, appears to be more common than ejaculation, and the fluid that's released during squirting is essentially watered-down urine, sometimes with a bit of ejaculate in it. It comes from the bladder. It exits via the urethra, same as when you pee. Female ejaculate is much thicker. It's a whitish fluid that resembles diluted milk. Female ejaculate contains some of the same components as semen. Ejaculate comes from Skene's glands or the female prostate. They're located on the front wall of the vagina surrounding the urethra. Uh, urethra. They can each contain openings that can release ejaculate. Although the glands were described in detail by Alexander Skene in the late 1800s, their similarity to the prostate uh, is a fairly recent discovery and research is ongoing. And this ejaculate is not urine. Ejaculate is mostly prostate enzymes with a hint of urea. Squirting diluted urine with a bit of ejaculate in it. So squirting is basically just sexy pissing. That's what it was called in several articles, sexy peeing. Uh, that's what the scientific data shows so far. So when you get squirted on, when it's just gushing out of ejaculate, that wasn't cum. You weren't came on, you were pissed on. Which is a kink, as we learned, that some people enjoy. Uh, last thoughts on female ejaculation. Women can ejaculate quite a bit of fluid. According to a 2013 study of 320 participants, the amount of ejaculate released can range from approximately 0.3 milliliters to more than 150 milliliters. That's more than half a cup. Unlike with men, female ejaculation is not always the product of orgasm. Some research indicates that while female ejaculation is usually the product of orgasm, it can also occur with G-spot uh, stimulation outside of orgasm. Right, so it's a it doesn't like shoot out, but it can just flow out. Uh, what's the G-spot known as the Grafenberg spot? The G-spot was introduced by Dr. Beverly Whipple after she discovered that using a come here motion, right? This little kind of on YouTube, I'm demonstrating, like kind of pulling your fingers back. Like, yeah, like when you're telling somebody to come here, like with your, um, she, sorry. So 
She discovered that using this come here motion along the inside of the vagina produces a physical response in women. She believed that this region could be the key to women achieving orgasm during sex instead of being its own separate spot in your vagina. The G spot is part of your clitoral network. That means that when you're stimulating the G spot, you're stimulating part of the clitoris, which is much larger than most believe. Turns out the pea sized nub where the inner labia meet is actually only the tip of the clitoris. And it divides into two roots that can be about four inches long each. Plus, this region can vary from woman to woman, which explains why it can be difficult to locate the G spot. However, once it's stimulated, the G spot can cause female ejaculation and help women reach vaginal orgasm, which is far less common than clitoral. Uh, uh, orgasm with women. Man, vagina is so much more complicated than weens. Punching that clown, you know, and then, you know, he, he tries to squirt you. Pretty simple. Vaginas, research is actually still ongoing to figure out exactly how they work. There. Squirting. We did it, you guys. We did it. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Sex suck sucked. <laughs> that was a fun change of pace. For me, at least, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, I've been liking the variety lately. A big thanks to the queen, my wife, Lindsay Cummins. Love her. I uh, love that we can talk about stuff like this. Thanks to the Time Suck team, High Priestess, uh, Harmony Camp, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, the Bit Elixir design crew, Logan and Kate at Spicy Club, running badmagicmerch.com, script keeper Zach Flannery. Thanks to the all seen eyes of the cult, helping Liz Hernandez run the Cult of the Curious Facebook group. Thank you, Liz. Never been a better time to jump in, get some socialization virtually. Uh, yeah, link in the episode description. Link in the episode description for Discord as well. Uh, next week we go traditional again, ready to return to some true crime serial killer, Robert Berdella, the Kansas city butcher, the collector killed at least six people between 84 and 88 in Kansas city. And he was a freak. 1982 Berdella began renting his own booth at the Westport flea market in Kansas city. The store was named Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, and it primarily sold and traded primitive art, jewelry, and antiques worked in the flea market. Berdella became acquainted with a fellow merchant named Paul Howell who operated a booth adjacent to his. Soon, Berdella became acquainted with Paul Howell's younger son, 19-year-old Jerry. Jerry would be his first victim. Ah, uh, man, his first victim, man, this guy, this guy. He told Jerry he was taking him to attend a dance contest uh, the day that Jerry disappeared. According to Berdella, he got him to drink some booze, had some Valium and a powerful tranquilizer in it. Then he injected Howell with another heavy tranquilizer, then tied him to his bed. Uh, this is the type of kink we should all shame. No consent with Bob's kink. He tied him up uh, there, kept him for over 24 hours, roughly 28 hours, repeatedly drugged, tortured, raped, and violated him with foreign objects. And then things got much worse from there. And then Bob got more depraved as his murders continued. And you will have to listen next week to learn more about this ruthless, weird son of a bitch. And now it is time we check in with this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. First update is a timely warning passed our way by super sucker Matthew Baker. Matthew writes, you guys, or no, yo guys. Dan mentioned something about not hearing anything about butt stuff being disallowed during our current crisis. Hear this, part of the New York City press release on how to stay safe. Uh, it includes definitions of sex acts to avoid, including rimming, which it also goes so far as to define. Science is iffy on a fecal oral transmission route, but there's enough evidence to support the probability. Possibly my favorite part of this information, as one Twitter user was quick to point out, when kids are having to do projects on COVID decades from now, they will inevitably come across the government sanctioned information warning us that licking each other's buttholes might not be a good idea right now. <laughs> Thanks for all that you do. Keeping the facts straight. I'm working urgent care right now and having the suck to listen to on the drive to and from work is a blessing. God bless and be safe, Matt Baker. Oh man, thank you, Matt. Yeah, good time to get freaky in the bedroom, but don't get too freaky. Don't get sick at the worst possible time. You don't want to add to our medical personnel's workload right now. You don't want to, uh, you know, go to the doctor for a bacterial infection and come home with COVID-19. And, and thanks for what you do and uh, thanks for doing what you do and continuing to do that right now, Matt, with the urgent care. Huge thanks to doctors, nurses, truck drivers, police officers, everyone else who has to keep working right now, people who constantly risk getting sick to keep society from falling apart. Hail Nimrod, so grateful uh, for all uh, that you do. And now from Belarus, the country taking this pandemic the least seriously by far. And if you're curious what I mean by that, oh, just Google COVID-19 in, in Belarus and you are fucking welcome. Wow. Uh, Time sucker and amazing artist Max Lazarow has given you a cool new video game to beta test. Max writes, hey Dan, 
It would be really awesome if you could help me spread the word. We just opened to beta testing and collecting feedback to improve the game and get an audience. Working title is Football Legends. Shortly, it's a mix of brawl and soccer with characters from British literature. Actually, you've already helped me with research about King Arthur and Dracula as they are playable characters in the game as well as a bunch of others like Sherlock Holmes or Alice in Wonderland. Maybe one day we could become big enough to have uh, to be honored to bring a time suck team onto the field. Oh my God, yes. Uh, and then Max included a short gameplay video uh, and then uh, a link to a Discord group where you can get our current game build, art, information, talk with players in the development team. And then a link to their Twitter. We can find out more information. And then Max says, thank you again for your, your proposal. And this was just, uh, I'm just, you know, offering him, offering to blast this out. I can imagine how hard to find time with the times of community growing fast. Gratefully, Max. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, I downloaded the game onto my Mac. Haven't had time to play yet. Too much time spent watching pony play videos this week. Uh, but I am putting the links you gave me into, in the episode description this week. Uh, so if you guys want to like download this beta test, you know, free and, and play this game, it looks awesome. And Max designed the poster that uh, we sold at Live Time Sucks in 2019. And Max, we just gave uh, we gave all the proceeds, you know, to the Dreaming Zebra Foundation. And we just got a big thank you yesterday uh, from them in the mail. So, it was so gratifying and just uh, so cool to see how many kids got art, art supplies and they used them to make the thank you notes. Uh, and so big thanks to you because you made all that possible. So hail Nimrod. Next up, top shelf sack, Kieran Hamry. Coming in hot from the land down under. Uh, Kieran writes, cunt. <laughs> I just want to start by saying that being an actor portraying an Australian because it isn't real has been super shit over the past six months. Feels like Chikatilo has been controlling the weather uh, when uh, after, you know, the huge ass motherfucking fires we had, they turned on the rain so hard we flooded. What's this big deal? I turned on the rain to stop fire, not water too much. And then for some weird fucked up reason, we started to hoard toilet paper first to protect ourselves from a virus. Fucking actors improvising shit. A little bit about myself. I currently work in the emergency services as well as moonlighting as a shelf packer to bring in extra cash. Two of the busiest jobs in the current climate. A little while ago, I had a particularly distressing call at work where I had to speak with the mother of a guy my age who had gassed himself. Usually things don't get to me, but I'd been at this guy's position before and the call flattened me. Since then, I haven't been able to answer phone calls because of the fear that it may be the same sort of call. Anyway, since then, I have been uh, working in the digital space, and because I'm no longer working shift work with my team, I have been doing so mostly alone. This got quite boring, and it didn't take long for me to find Time Suck, which has helped me through these shifts. More than you may possibly know, I'm not one to talk about issues, but having the knowledge that if I reached out to spaces I would be supported is a massive comfort. I'm working my way through the back catalog, listening to two, three podcasts a shift. I have recently finished Illuminati Revealed episode 114. In it, you stated, I want to get this right. I think it's important today in today's climate to get shit right as, as much as you possibly can to be as factual as possible. I think this comment is so relevant with today's current issues. I've been saying that social media has spread COVID-19 quicker than the actual disease. The fact that more people are listening to social media celebrities and celebrities in general rather than medical professionals just goes to show how stupid and gullible the world has become. I'll freely admit that social media has its advantages, such as getting small businesses exposure, including my own photography company, Mad Snappers, shameless plug. <laughs> However, if people don't research the information uh, that they see and blindly believe it, it leads to mass panic and hysteria and fucking toilet paper hoarding, for fuck's sake. Anyway, sorry about the super long and dreary email. Thanks for everything you do. Hopefully you'll come to the warehouse where we film everything Australia related soon. Secret space lizard, Kieran the Hammer Hamry. P.S. Referring to someone as a cunt in Australia is a term of endearment and mateship. I loved it, Karen. Honored to be your cunt. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for this and for reminding me that, yes, accuracy is important. I do my best in this regard because I see so many others just spread half-ass info, false info. It's infuriating. So much misinformation spread about COVID-19 in the past few months. It made researching last week suck uh, that much more difficult. I really hope to make it to sweet, fake Australia to that warehouse soon. I guess it's probably in Southern California. Uh, I hope to make it to your fake country someday. Hail Nimrod to you. And now a community shout out from Dark Star. Dark writes, hey, suck master. Just wanted to take a minute and give a huge shout out to this community. My son's birthday is April 4th. He's stuck at home because of the shelter in place in Ohio. He's turning 10 and really bummed about not being able to see his friends or do anything. I went onto the Cult of the Curious Facebook page to see if anyone might be willing to send him a birthday card. And the response has been amazing. These are the best group of people in the world. Now the group is trying to organize an online party for all the kids stuck in quarantine on their birthdays. My family is so grateful to be involved with such amazing meat sacks. Much love from the stars in Ohio. Well, fucking yes. 
Yay to the cult of the curious. Happy birthday, little star. Man, if you listen to today's suck, you didn't just turn 10. You turned about 35. Love hearing how amazing our community is. The best. Uh, thanks for being the best. And now one more. A funny one to end on. Kick-ass meat sack, Kyle Patchen, fell victim to Cummins Law. Kyle writes, to the motherfucker master sucker. Hail Lucifina, goddammit, Bojangle, stop licking your balls. And can someone please put on some Michael motherfucking McDonald? Longtime listener, loyal spaces are writing in. I did not believe it was true, but it fucking happened. Cummins Law. I was listening to the Pinkerton Detective Agency, Suck 116, and as I was walking through the operating room hallway at work, and I had just placed my phone in my back pocket, picture it, myself, two physician assistants, two surgeons are walking down the hallway to go to a case, all is silent, and then out of nowhere you hear, I would rather have my gangrene on my dick rather than have gangrene on my tongue. The cardiac surgeon I was with looked at me and said, well, we know what you're into in your free time, and then everyone laughed when I turned while I turned red in the face. Ah, thank you for bringing me this beautifully humiliating experience during this stressful time. I will never more uh, underestimate the laws of the cult. Uh, know that you have some loyal healthcare space wizards from Cleveland, Ohio, seeking shelter within your cult to escape the grim reality we face in the front lines of this pandemic. Hope to see you in May. Your ever faithful meat sack, Kyle. Uh, and on PS, Lindsay is safe from COVID-19 as living in Parma, Ohio. I just completed a small study proving that the virus is too scared to go near Polax. Yes, thank you, Kyle. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, pretty sure Polish people are safe. COVID-19 has not yet jumped uh, over to their species, as far as I know. As far as I know, it's, it's really only affecting human beings right now. Love that you share this. Thank you for working on the front lines. Stay safe as you can. Uh, thanks for helping to save fucking lives. And thanks for sharing that story. It cracked me up. Uh, you know, I hope you get the kind of blowjob I talked about earlier for your efforts. Or some awesome butt play. Or you know what? Fucking pony play, puppy play, whatever you're into. Hail Nimrod. And hail Lucifina. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for today, Meat Sacks. New Scared to Death late Tuesday night. New Secret Suck on Thursday. New album on Pandora right now. Get out of here, devil. Stay safe this week. Suck and fuck and spank and gallop and whinny and neigh and keep on sucking. <laughs> Yeah!